Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> Ever get the feeling you've been cheated? It is Tuesday, September 8th, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning majority report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, author, podcast host, Kurt Anderson, on his latest evil genius, The Unmasking of America, a recent history. Meanwhile, the 2020 election goes into high gear and Trump's money advantage disappears Trump announces that he will present a new list of potential Supreme Court nominees on Wednesday, a key part of his 2016 victory. Meanwhile, the House Oversight Committee to investigate the reports that Louis DeJoy, Postmaster General, reportedly was involved in illegal campaign donations. Experts fear that COVID surge will, uh, a COVID surge in the lead up to the November election, cresting just after it. The AP reports of fears of a triply of a, a tripling of absentee ballot rejections, and Secretary of State's expect delayed results on well, election week. The left begins to contemplate MAGA violence if Trump loses. Federal judge rules the NSA delayed a data collection illegal seven years later. And a judge orders the census field ops to continue, at least for the moment. All this and more on today's program. Welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am uh, broadcasting from the studio today um, all by my lonesome. It's a, it's a little bit lonely in here, uh, but uh, it's a, I haven't made the full transition, but we're going to be doing that uh, uh, sometimes uh, here and sometimes other places. And oddly enough, this studio is more difficult to broadcast from in this uh, COVID age because it's not built for people to be remote. It's built for everybody to be here. So Matt had to run down to the office to fix uh, things um, uh, this morning. Um, So kudos to Matt. Um, He came in, he had his own um, uh, oxygen tank and um, came in the bubble here into the... Matt, was this the first time you've been in the office in months? Uh, Yeah, I I snuck in once like early in COVID uh, to grab some supplies, but uh, that was the last time. I see you left your your, uh, Pop-Tarts though. I know, I thought about grabbing those, but they'll still be good for me whenever (laughs) this is over. (laughs) There's a slight chance that uh, I may throw them out. I hope that's all right with you. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I I guess I'll check the date and if they're, uh, they, I mean... You could leave those things open, right? And they'd still be good six, seven, eight months later. Well, that's how you you can toast them in the open air that way. Right. So them dry out. Right. All right. Well, that's good. Uh, no, like the bargaining's coming up. So yeah, there's uh we'll see. Well, uh, yeah, we'll see with the, what I do with those uh, pop tarts, but um, yeah, this office needs a cleaning. It looks a little bit uh, disheveled and um, we're going to rework it, but uh, it will work for the uh, time being. Thank you for joining us, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I know we've got, uh, our guest, uh, waiting. We've got a couple ads here to get to. And then, um, uh, 
One of the things I've always said that's important to me is that I do not like, now this is a little idiosyncratic, but I was on the whole, uh, I don't want to put aluminum on, under my arms and um, I don't know what diseases are going to come from that or whatnot, but I just, I, I've always been very skeptical, I have to say, of any of the, uh, you know, the, the, I don't want to say all hygienic products, but many. Uh, and so uh, I believe for me, that uh, reading the label on any of this stuff that you put on you is uh, hugely important. I do it with food. I do it with a bunch of stuff. Uh, well, that's why my deodorant is native. Native is made with ingredients you've actually heard of, like coconut oil, shea butter, tapioca starch, although to be fair, I never heard of that. But they don't use things like aluminum or parabens or sulfates or talc. It's also vegan. It's never tested on animals. Native just released plastic-free deodorant made from 100% paperboard and shipped in a plastic-free bag. Switching to an aluminum-free deodorant doesn't mean you have to sacrifice on odor protection. Native will keep you smiling and feeling fresh all day. Native comes in over 10 cents, like coconut, vanilla, lavender, and rose, plus rotating seasonals like pumpkin spice latte collection. Native is risk-free to, uh, risk to try has free shipping in the U.S. and a free 30-day returns and exchanges. Now, uh, uh, even short-time listeners of this program will know that I uh, have a very low threshold of tolerance for any type of smell. And so um, for me, my favorite scent of native is the unscented. I did try the coconut. I liked it. Coconut I can handle. Anything that has not, anything that's like floral, I'm not good with. It, it, it's, I'm allergic to it, or I don't know what it is. But um, I've been using the native um, uh, unscented and it works great. Got me off of those like, um, I don't know. They have like sort of wooey type of uh, stuff that is, you know, it doesn't, doesn't work. Uh, but the native unscented has been great for me. So do what I did. Switch to native today by going to nativedo.com slash majority. That's nativedeo.com slash majority, or use the promo code majority at checkout. You get 20% off your first order. That's nativedeo.com slash majority, or use the promo code majority at checkout for 20% off your first order. Also, uh, this episode brought to you by Magic Spoon. Had some this morning, so didn't my kid. It's the one series, it's one of the few things that we like to eat together now. And as you remember, breakfast cereal, one of the best parts of being a kid. This is actually going to come up in the interview today with Kurt Anderson a little bit. Because there's a certain amount of nostalgia that people have for uh, cereals when they were younger. Now, the problem with the cereals that you had when you were a kid is that they were junky, full of sugar and all sorts of other crap. Um, I know, Matt, I know you don't, uh, because you're a millennial, you don't... Uh, eat cereal because that would mean you'd have to clean a bowl or something. Right. But you could eat it out of the box. Well, um, can't get milk in there. That's well, that's true. You can't, but, uh, but I know, but that way you don't have to do any cleaning, but there's a, uh, a, a an easier way to relive the magic of your childhood without eating all that junk food. Magic spoon is a new cereal company. It's discovered a way to recreate your favorite childhood cereals with zero grams of sugar, 11 grams of protein, and only three net grams of carbs in each serving. They offer four flavors based on the all-time classics, cocoa, fruity, frosted, and blueberry. You can figure out what those uh, all-time classics were. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to mention those or not, but in my household, it is the cocoa and the fruity. I'm the cocoa, my kid's the fruity. But I will say this. Well, in addition to it being keto-friendly, it's gluten-free, it's grain-free, it's soy-free, it's low-carbon, it's GMO-free. Look, I'm a cocoa guy. There are other, they have other um, flavors that you should check out. I don't know. They don't, they're, they're not into like uh, us talking about those other flavors, but, uh, but I've tried them all. We get a lot of cereal from these guys now. It is the, it is the primary breakfast meal, and sometimes... I'll be honest with you. I can't sleep at night. I get up at uh, three in the morning. I have a bowl of cereal and it's always magic spoon because it's not full of garbage. It's delicious. Go to magic spoon.com slash majority report. You grab a variety pack. You try it today. 
Be sure to use our promo code Majority Report at checkout to get free shipping. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it is backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they refund your money, no questions asked. That's magicspoon.com slash majority report. Use the code majority report for free shipping. I want to thank Magic Spoon both for sponsoring the show and frankly, uh, for allowing me to give my kids some cereal in the morning that I don't feel bad about, that I actually feel good about. And uh, Saul looks at the label and he's just like, dad, this has no grams of sugar. It's weird what you get proud of about your kid. All right. Lastly, um, as you know, uh, one of our um, premier sponsors is Sunset Lake CBD. They are a um, CBD grower and seller, I guess, uh, located in uh, Vermont, just outside of Burlington. They work with the University of Vermont with their uh, regenerative farming uh, agricultural practices. All of their CBD is 100% pesticide free. They only use organic fertilizers. They have a third party test that you can see on their website. You can get it certified, et cetera, et cetera. They, uh, they have great business practices, $15 minimum wage, the company is majority employee owned. Um, if you like to smoke cannabis, but you don't want to get super stoned, like the heady stone, but just like the body stoned, Matt can speak to the multitude of different uh, ways that they have for you to do that. There's pre-rolls. They sent me a big, one of those big spleefs. Matt is uh, digging it. What is your favorite? The smalls or something? The, the smalls, yeah. The nugs come in these little small, I guess, nuggets, and uh, they go right in the grinder. You don't even have to break them apart with your hands. But they also have gummies, which are fantastic. They've got tincture, which I use. Is it tincture? I guess that's what it is. Yep. They have a solve that is great that I've been using. Now, to be honest with you, I got an email. Somebody said they tried it on their eczema. It didn't work, but they love this stuff anyways for their uh, joints and whatnot. But for me, I found the solve to, to work on my uh, eczema. Uh, I've sent it to a bunch of other people. They have Farmer's Roast CBD coffee. Uh, check it out. If you use the coupon code left is best, you get 20% off. Left is best, one word, 20% off of all their CBD products. You cannot go wrong. Uh, try it out. We were all CBD skeptics here before. And um, now I'm leaning on it, maybe a little too much, but uh, <laughs> it's, you know, stressful times, folks. All right. Should we do this a uh, quick um, uh, video, Matt, uh, Brendan? Uh, I think we should bring him on. Okay. All right. Let's take a, a quick break. Oh, oh, do we have him on Zoom? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep, here uh, he comes. Let me uh, bring to the program. Kurt Anderson, he was the co-founder of Spy Magazine, former editor-in-chief at New York Magazine, author of, uh, of many books. His latest book is Evil Genius, The Unmasking of America, A Recent History, uh, which is, in many respects, um, Kurt, uh, a, a companion volume to Fantasyland, How America Went Haywire, A 500-Year History. Welcome to the program. Happy to be here. Uh, let me also say, and this is really... Uh, I don't know if it's really uh, been a, a slight for you, but it's, I want to apologize to both my audience and myself for not having you on uh, before now. I've got to tell you that turn of the century, this is, we're going back a little bit, but your book, Turn of the Century, has read, resonated uh, for me for 20 years. And, wow, how nice uh, of you. And, and I don't know what it was that, 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 that uh, took me so long to do this, but um, so let what you've done here, it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's almost like you have done a, uh, because many of the things you're talking about in, um, in Evil Geniuses is um, a lot of what we, we, we talk about on this program quite a bit. We had Rick Perlstein on the other day, who, who, whose, whose most recent uh, his, uh, book was um, uh, sort of the, the last, or maybe not the last, uh, but uh, uh, covering a, a lot of the period where a lot of this change happened uh, that you write about. And you've written a, almost like a, uh, both a, a political, but also cultural, um, uh, I guess, uh, history that is accessible about how we got off track. But, but let's start with, um, with, uh, with fantasy land a little bit, because this, okay. it was almost like, uh, if I understand correctly, in fantasy land, you, um, you sort of outlined a, a problem that we had in this country. And then afterwards, you sort of said, like, wait, how did we get here? 
Well, exactly. There's kind of two separate problems. The problem in fantasy land is, is uh, basically, as I discovered after researching it for some years and writing the book, is that we have this deep-seated American love of the excitingly untrue, right? <laughs> and, 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 and that's that was okay up to a point because the grown-ups who believed in rationality were in charge. And so, you know, whatever, as Thomas Jefferson said, and I quote him many times in that book, if it doesn't, I don't care what anybody believes, the government shouldn't try to stop any from anyone from believing anything as long as it doesn't break my leg or pick my pocket. I, I'm with that. Um, but then it did start breaking our legs and picking our pockets when it was politically exploited and weaponized, this kind of crazy thinking of anything is true and conspiracy theories that aren't true and all the rest. That was the story of Fantasyland. It was, but it was, it was sort of organic. That was in the bloodstream of America, you know, from way back. And it was this like chronic condition that became an acute illness in the last couple of decades and, and allowed Donald Trump, the great symptom of it to, to become president. So then I finished that and I realized, wait, that is only half the story. There, there was something else, that, it just, believing in crazy things and aliens running the government or whatever it is you believe did not change our system the way it was changed when I was a young man, right? I mean, I, I grew up in one version of America that was fair and still the New Deal idea was still there and all boats rose together and, and, and rich people paid a lot more taxes and all the rest. Then that stopped. And, 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 and even though I was around and a writer and sometimes a journalist during that period of the 70s and 80s, uh, well, 80s anyway, uh, uh, I, I kind of didn't, I realized looking back now that I hadn't fully noticed what had happened. And it was that these people, guys, uh, who I, I won't call it a conspiracy, but it was certainly, I call it repeatedly in the book, a confederacy of these guys who had, who were either right wings ideological zealots, Milton Friedmanites, or rich people, or CEOs. And they, and they created a whole strategy and battle plan and counter establishment to make America what it became, where, where only the well to do and, and big business get richer and more powerful. And, and, and of course, you know, um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, you certainly have, have, have mentioned that 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 era that we were talking about, there was, well, the big difference, right, between that era where we had the, with the Great Compression and we had that we were in the post uh, uh, or, or in the, the the wake of the New Deal, I guess, um, was that it was it was in many respects. Uh, reserved for a segment of the population. There were segments of the population, uh, black people and, and 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 women to a large extent. Um, uh, you know, I mean, in many respects, uh, uh, large swaths, if not the majority of, of the population, yeah. didn't necessarily I I enjoy that in the same manner. But, right. But, but what was it? Didn't. What and, was and, and God knows, we don't want to go back to in time in terms of the way white supremacy was more supreme and patriarchy was more supreme, but economically, and this book, Evil Geniuses really is not about the whole right wing and the anti-abortion crazies and all that. They're there because they became the political, and the racists became the political allies of the economic right, the Cokes and that ilk. And so I'm focusing on economic unfairness. Economic fairness for, for, for all households, black, white, black and white, uh, uh, during the you know, 50s and 60s and 70s was increasing. All boats were rising together. Now, yes, there was a gigantic gap between white households and black households and still is, and it's egregious and awful. But as, as, as the economy grew and productivity grew, all households were, were sharing in that equal, rich people and middle-class people and poor people shared equally in that rise. That, and, and then they stopped. And, you know, and we used to have an aggressive antitrust enforcement against, against uh, you know, corporate power when it got too big. We used to have pay half the workers in America overtime, we stopped. You know, all these things that just, we, as though there was a giant national referendum and we changed it so that 80% of Americans 
are economically less fair. But yes, to your point, it wasn't all, my Make America Great Again is not going back in the ways uh, that, 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 that Donald Trump and his, 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 his cult wants to go back. But let's, th- there was a bit there back in the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s, which is to say economic fairness, that wasn't going too badly. All right. And so uh, and, and I want to spend, um, uh, you know, more time on the cultural stuff. I mean, we over the past couple of weeks, we have talked um, uh, we've had uh, many talks about the, what you mentioned in terms of the antitrust and the change during the, the, the Reagan era where the uh, the calculus for what constituted monopoly changed from uh, being sort of more uh, citizen uh, and, and about competition, broadly speaking, and about uh, citizenry to just simply prices and under uh, Bork and, and whatnot. And I want to get to that a little bit. But in terms of the fantasy land thing, this this notion of because I'm also fascinated about this character of, of of the American people, and I reference this book far too often. But uh, Emily Odgin's uh, credulity about me- uh, mesmerism, and about how there's a long history in this country of people wanting, you know, buying into sort of some of these fantasies, and uh, in their relationship with the people who tell them that. What what is the relationship between what took place starting in the early 70s, really in, in many respects in the wake of, of the emancipation of women and of black people to the extent that, you know, uh, they have become emancipated, at least from a legal perspective? Um, what What is it about the development of these fantasies? Is it, is it, in how is that related specifically to all the changes that took place that have economically um, very slowly, almost like, you know, the frog doesn't know he's boiling type of situation. I would say certainly, first of all, uh, uh, what I found out in this book and talk about in Evil Geniuses is that the the battle plan was starting way before Ronald Reagan, way before 1980. They they had a whole decade of, of planning. And again, I really had no idea, but I would say the biggest fantasy that they used also started at the beginning of the 1970s, was, which was this American pop cultural and general cultural plunge into nostalgia. You know, the 60s was all about everything's new, man, it's wow, which was, of course, an, a kind of extreme version of what America had always been, embracing the new, let's do something new, let's move somewhere new, let's invent something new. And it reached a kind of, as I call it, peak new in the, in the late 1960s. And then Oh my gosh! Let's go back to Bedford Falls. Let's let. Oh, wasn't it? Look, American Graffiti. Wasn't it nice just before the '60s? Yeah. Hmm. And so, as that, as, as, as really, and I document how how sudden and and total and strange that was in the 1970s. This 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 embrace of nostalgia and the recent-ish past in so many ways. The right, the Reaganites, used that brilliantly, beautifully. You know, uh, go back, if, if people haven't seen it, the 1984 ad uh, that, maybe the best ad, political ad ever for Ronald Reagan's reelection, which basically made the present day in 1984 and, and its wonderfulness attributable to one term of Reagan look like the past. It was like, look, we've made it like a beautiful small town with all white people. Isn't that fantastic? It's morning in America. So, so... But in so many ways, they use that. Like, let's go back. Yeah, no, the 60s, that was crazy. Let's go back before that. Now, how far you want to go back before that and exactly what we mean by that back then, of course, the racism and, 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 and misogyny were all dog whistly, unlike now. Um, so they, that, I would say that's the biggest fantasy that we could go back in the past. And, and, and that this, this nostalgic idea of, of living in some old timey America was, was a realizable idea. But, but then specifically, I mean, I would say, you know, what, was, what they named supply side economics, which is to say, you, 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 you radically reduce income taxes for rich people and, and, and corporations, and somehow that money will all go down to everybody and all boats will continue rising. Well. It didn't happen. And it hasn't happened again and again and again for 40 years as they keep making that case as they did as recently as 2017, you know, when they reduced taxes by a couple of trillion dollars. So, so that, that, that supply side fantasy is a disproven economic fantasy, but 
it's it's still the one that the the right and the Republicans uh, trot out every time they're they're in power. What would it, I mean, I understand the, I mean, I want to talk about the mechanism of that nostalgia because I find that fascinating. And, 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 and certainly, I mean, and uh, I keep bringing back turn of the century, but, you know, uh, in that era, um, I was um, in, uh, in Hollywood and I was in, in entertainment and that was even in the late 90s. Uh, this nostalgia was still in very much effect. I mean, it was a machine that would just pump stuff out. And I had theories about what was going on at that time that it had to do with, you know, because I had a lot of um, uh, involvement with entertainment executives. And there was, I think, a lot of people who were simply arrested in their development and they were going back and trying to relive their childhood in a way when uh, that uh, they could experience it in a in a in a different way. Uh, and then maybe they, you know, look, there's a lot of people in, in show business who whose childhoods were not optimal and they want to go back and, and re-experience that. But what was going on in the 70s? I mean, as you mentioned, like, I'm, you know, I remember the Reagan ads, but I'm thinking like Lords of Flatbush, Happy Days. I mean, there there were, uh, you know, uh, uh, Laverne and Shirley. I mean, there was all these things. Correct. These were major shows uh, that were in, and and, you know, that were go were going backwards to uh in in selling it to to kids and this is you know uh i mean there was there was a whole raft what was the impetus behind that was it just well, like it, the we want to get pre was, racial pardon me we want to be pre uh like racial on some way uh, well i mean i i think it's hard to imagine that that wasn't part of it mostly unconsciously that like oh before the war and by the way, I, I never realized until I was researching fantasy line because I'm stupid that antebellum, which we think of as when slavery existed before the Civil War, meant that specifically. It means before any war. So antebellum before the Vietnam War and all of its oh my gosh, look at all, what that said, and before civil rights and and when it was all and before women were in the workplace. So I, I yeah I do think part so much of that. Uh, pleasure that white America, especially, suddenly took in in looking back at the past with all those TV shows you mentioned, as well as a million movies. I mean, uh, again, I, I I catalog them here. It's amazing how many of the big movies in the '70s, from Animal House to Godfather, what, right. and and a, a dozens more, were oh look, wow, this the the early '60s, oh wow, the '50s, oh wow, the '40s, that was great. So it was, and and I think it was partly the the you know, pre-civil rights, pre-women's liberation fantasy. Um, but I also think, you know, more charitably, some of it was just uh, 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 this kind of, the, the 60s was <laughs> discombobulating. Whatever you thought of the, the achievements of the 60s, and I'm all for most of them, uh, uh, it was still exhausting. Like, oh God, everything is so new, so all the time. And things changed back then in a year as much as they change in a decade or two now. I mean, it was nuts. So I think part of it, again, charitably, was just like, oh, let's, 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 like, let's get back, let's get back to normal again. But the, the thing you say about uh, show business executives wanting to live there or have a redo of their youth, I think that's true. And I think it's true of starting with baby boomers, this, what, this, 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 sort of refusal to grow up in a certain way. And, th and this, and whether it's a nostalgia for a particular time, it is this nostalgia for their lost adolescence. Like they wanted to be teenagers forever. And so they started, adults as they never had, started wearing jeans and sneakers and getting high and listening to rock and roll. And like, there was no stop to that. You know, you, you could do that at 30 and 40 and 50 and 60. So, and, and then every generation subsequent to the baby boomers kept on doing that. So. I think that is a is a is a piece of of the nostalgia, but but it's as, as you're suggesting a more kind of personalized one. Like, eh, let's make it like I'm a cool kid or a cooler kid in eighteen when I was eighteen, and and make and kind of live that way forever. Which you know, as you know, uh, there are certain people in Hollywood who uh, follow that uh, routine. Indeed. 
Um, and just as you were saying about that nostalgia, all I'm thinking about is, you know, that's what Archie Bunker was, right? I mean, they literally opened their show every night about singing about how we want to go back to a time where we understood the rules more uh, as to, you know, men were men and um, et cetera, et cetera. And there was no welfare and Herbert Hoover was president. Yes, exactly. Um, so, all right. So we have this, let's, let's go through some of just the history, because I think one of the things that, um, that, that you do quite well is uh, bring together these sort of disparate um, economic pushes that, um, that come out of that, that, you know, are neoliberal and, and, and almost like classically neoliberal, right? Milton Friedman came out of a, a tradition that, that, that started with Mont Pelerin and, um, and, and these ideas um, uh, find their way into uh, the, the sort of the body politic, you know, some um, much of which is like, uh, or at least the outline on how to disseminate these comes from the Lewis Powell memo, uh, who ultimately ended up very shortly after uh, writing that to becoming a Supreme Court justice. Hey, so, it was two whole months. <laughs> uh, you know, Nixon, that's it. That was a good memo. But uh, let, just lay that out for us it, that there, and like you say, it was, um, People with aligned interests got together in some instances, actually like said, here's a project for us to do in other instances. Well, you know, it was just their interests were aligned with this. Um, give us a sense of, 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 of what was laid out in that memo and also what it was in reaction to. Yeah. Well, the, the memo, the Powell memo, uh, which is one of these, I don't know, half dozen or 10 memos that I, found it's the most famous of them and it's not that famous you know of it and people know of it but there are several memos that like if they were if they were in a novel about this you'd go that's a little on the nose I don't think that you know uh, really uh, writing that out in advance in 1971 and then that's what happens I don't think so but so it was Lewis Powell was not a right winger Lewis Powell was a Virginia lawyer of national prominence corporate lawyer you know he, he was a Democrat actually uh, back when, you know, certain kinds of Southerners, white Southerners were Democrats who aren't now. But anyway, he wasn't a radical zealot of any kind. But it's in the late 60s, he, he, he became freaked out that, you know, all the kids are, are, are loving Ho Chi Minh and there's going to be a revolution here. I mean, and I'm, that's not an exaggeration. He, he talked about that kind of thing. He was, he, he'd given a speech actually, that I write about a year before he wrote the Powell memo at the behest of the Chamber of Commerce, in which he just goes whole holer hog about like this is nuts. The you know the, the socialist revolution is in the air, and we could all be wiped away, and business will be gone. So I would say that's in his case, and in many of the cases of of these folks, was was a kind of like oh my gosh, if this keeps going like it's gone the last five years in 1970-71, like we're going to be out of business. So that was part of it, and but but he was this very sober lawyer of great decorum, and had, who 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 adv has advised his corporate clients for decades, and that's what the Powell memo is. It's forty five page memo saying, "Here's what we got to do. This is how we change the public sentiment. This is how we change the elite sentiment. This is how uh, the corporate." Uh, Big wigs need to get together and and lobby on behalf of corporate capitalism rather than they're just their individual companies, and on and on and on and on. Oh, we, we need the law and the judiciary is a great opportunity for us. We got to do that. So he lays out boom piece by piece. This is what we've got to do to just save ourselves. So I think really back then it wasn't like, and then by 1980 when we have a president and we have all these you know. Uh, uh, sort of Democrats who are willing to go along, then we'll do this. I, I'm not suggesting that it was that kind of a conspiracy because nobody is that smart or right. they can be evil, but they're not that geniusy. So, uh, but he did lay it out and, 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 and immediately it was secret for a year and then it became, then it leaked and was out, but it was immediately taken up by literally by Charles Koch and other of a, of a different kind of person is liber economic libertarian uh, uh, crew. And in, in Koch's case, uh, a zillionaire as well, a fossil fuel zillionaire as well. And it was taken and talked about as our game plan. This is what we have to do. So it wasn't just interesting and amazing in retrospect. It was a real game plan, actionable 
uh, strategy at the time. So, so that's kind of what, what happened. I mean, and, and people like Koch and libertarianism and Milton Friedman, who as of 1970 suddenly became famous, a celebrity economist, which previously the, the, the people you talk about were, were there and they were active. And they had been since the New Deal in their little fringy way, um, um, but working at it, working at it in, and, you know, Robert Bork and Yale and all these people, um, but not until the late 60s, as I argue in this book, when like, sure, anything goes, libertarianism, fine, whatever. Uh, everybody do their own thing, including, you know, billionaires and, and libertarian right-wing zealots. So that, that was, ironically, their, their great opening was, was, you know, the counterculture. And, and that, the countercultural revolution, because of course they were a counterculture. That, that's the thing people need to understand. They were not, it wasn't like it was soon after. They were still fringe, freaks, right. marginalized, you know? I mean, they're, they're you know, I guess um, the, uh, that, that Adam Curtis film, uh, Hypernormalcy, talks about that yes. idea of, of individualism. Um, I mean, you can see where that individualism and the lack of, you know, the, the sort of like uh, the, the individualism that came out of the 60s in terms of being able to express yourself and not have to conform uh, and work at IBM for 50 years or whatever it was, um, mutates into or adopts, you know, just sort of like becomes a, a um, I'm, I'm mixing a lot of metaphors here, a fertile host for this individualism as it's expressed in economics. Now, of course, uh, neoliberal uh, thought is actually a little bit more nuanced and they want to put the thumb, they just want to have more control, I think, than just sort of like a complete anarchy when it comes to this. But um, right. you could see how that could hop along for the ride and, and sneak in there in, in some respects. And to be clear, like when, when the Powell memo was written, I mean, he, he built a, a molehill, right? And it turned into a mountain in, in many respects. But there probably was other like competing memos that you can't even find today because they just didn't work. <laughs> and this one just sort of resonated because it was of the multitude of options. If you got, you know, uh, millionaires out there, they're going to fund a bunch of this stuff. Right. And the ones that work are the ones that you, you, you still remember 40 years later, 50 years totally. later. Well, and to your point, though, he also became a Supreme Court justice shortly thereafter. And by the way, was part of some important decisions of the Supreme Court. Uh, oh conti- you know, nice to have an inside uh, track. Uh, 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 for instance, uh, eviscerating any attempt at, at, at campaign finance regulation right. and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, and, and one does want to be careful of like looking back and saying, oh, look, uh, of the kind of retroactive just so story of, oh, look, the Powell memo, it told everything. However, you know, you look at, that again, that it wasn't just a random memo that nobody saw, but one that the billionaires took up. It, it was more than, I mean, yes, no doubt. There were other people doing various things. There were the guys, the two guys who started the Heritage Foundation, the right-wing think tank, or just a, a year later. And, and so there were other people in the memo. thinking along the same lines. Right. I mean, called for in the memo. And uh, you know, we spoke to Rick Perlstein, like I say, I think it was last week, and and and, and the Heritage Foundation sort of ended up, uh, be, you know, combining forces with the evangelical right, and there was a lot of things that that sort of came together in that miasma. So, let's also talk about because um, uh, while you were writing, I guess, uh, turn of the century, you were you you. This was a period of time where you, you know, as and I found that that I, I mean. Like I said, I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, gush too much. It was uh, 20 years ago. I haven't oh, go on. It, sadly, but it was, but it really uh, defined that era for me. And I think it was also just like where I was uh, in my life at that time to watch sort of like this insanity that was taking place in New York at that time in terms of real estate, in terms of like this notion of like, I, I got to get involved in this like dot com thing. And um, in fact, I, I did. Uh, and the company went out of business almost like Me right now. Uh, I got the, uh, I, I, I still have um, mini DV cams that came from no. uh, that. that, that no, influence. and by the, for, for, for your, the great majority of your listeners who aren't familiar with Turn of the Century, it is a novel. It is not a nonfiction book. I used to, before, before these last two books, I, I, I wrote novels. So, so yes, but I, I appreciate that. And it was, although it was a novel, but I mean, my, my conscious attempt at the time was to capture this weird moment that seemed like some kind of inflection point. Yeah, sure. 
And, 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 and I really think it did. And, but simultaneously, I mean, in, 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 in evil geniuses, you uh, look back on that era for yourself as one where you really weren't paying attention to what was actually going on. Oddly enough, because I, I found that, that, that novel very insightful of that moment, but there was another undercurrent, I guess, uh, that, that you were missing. Talk about yeah, that. I was paying attention certainly to the culture and the culture of money and idiots who would go around saying, we're creating wealth for everyone. We're creating wealth for everyone. I mean, it, it was satirical and it made fun of that stuff, but it was a, no a, it was a novel and a novel that, you know, makes a big case about systemic inequality and insecurity is not really a novel probably i've never seen it but you know you know what i'm saying so so that isn't the 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 the, the uh, mission or purpose of fiction so much however uh but but to your point and i you know repeatedly mea culpa in this in evil geniuses to say i wasn't really paying close enough attention or caring enough about oh, there, there's a rust belt now. Oh, manufacturing workers are now losing their jobs. Eh, too bad. That's, that's too bad. It'll work itself out somehow because it always works itself out, right? It's, it's all the industrial revolutions have led to it working, sorting itself out somewhere. So yeah, yeah I would say that my, my relative affluence and, and relative success uh, led me to be uh, uh, inured to and, and sort of not caring enough about this systemic change. And, you know, also not, not, to, not to, 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 you know, defend myself either, but, but it, until the 90s, I, at least, I should have been paying more attention by the 90s, but so much of what was done was not instant, you know? They did right. not cancel, so they did not repeal Social Security and Medicare. They did not repeal the EPA. They did not get rid of minimum wage laws. They did all these clever, it was an undermining, it was a slow motion change from the New Deal to the raw deal, as I call it. So, so it wasn't quite clear. The, the, the cultural change was the fact that a, a, a freak like Donald Trump could be a respected famous person in the 1980s and 1990s was clearly, you know, he was a guy who couldn't have existed in, in the 1970s or before. You know, this ostentatious bully, oh yeah, we love that. Um, uh, so I was aware more of the cultural changes that I, and of some of the political changes, but, but, but I, I was not aware, nor was my professional mission at the time, uh, about looking at those kind of systemic political economic changes. When did, when did this happen? It was in many respects, this is a, um, uh, this is a, Almost, I guess, a story of radicalization. Um, uh, the, when did when like when was the moment uh, for you? I would say starting in the two thousands, in the early two thousands. I, I, I mentioned uh, an incident in the book where uh, one day in the year two thousand six, I'd, I'd gone back to my hometown of Omaha, Nebraska, for the last time. My parents had died, and and uh, and and and. and fell in one morning and talked for a couple of hours with these two airline pilots and like, Oh, airline pilots. You know, I still had a, like a boys like, Whoa, right. these are, these are professional heroes and all that. And they were just so they felt ruined, cheated. The whole system had, 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 had wrecked them. They didn't trust United airlines. Why does the CEO get so much money? They lied about our pensions on and on and on and on. And, and it was like, a moment that made me think like, whoa, this, this, you know, the, 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 there is something, I, I, it, if, if I had an epiphany on the road to Damascus, it was the road to Epley Airfield in Omaha, but still it, it was, that was the thing that made me go like, wow, I, I have not been paying attention. And this isn't the America, you know, that I grew up in. And, and then I started reading harder and thinking harder, um, you know, and then it was, <laughs> it was slow motion. I would say, you know, sometime that took, I would say, most of a decade, really, to to. So it was it was, yes, a slow motion, middle aged radicalization. Yes. I mean, it's interesting to me, too, because that it, particularly in that era in, in 2005, 2006, we were seeing uh, United Airlines. We were seeing multiple major corporations 
basically throw off their pension. It went into the pension guarantee trust. The pension guarantee trust was like under very shaky ground at that point. It was almost the end of, it was almost the death, the, the final nail in the coffin of defined benefit uh, pensions right in that era. Totally. Well, like, but, but again, it had been, it had been coming. I mean, basically totally starting totally. in the eighties, they yep. just they decided, no, that norm of giving everybody a fixed pension, well, you're not going to do that anymore. You know? Right. The experiment of the 401k came in that era, but it took all these years uh, for it. And, and, and we see it in the context of, I mean, there's many things, the rollback of the capital gains taxes, the, uh, the idea that you can buy back your own stocks. These are all things that happened in the 80s. And we don't see the impact of these really in a clear way for at least a decade or two. Right. Um, it's also interesting to me that it was in Omaha that you had this moment. Having lived in New York for so many years, it was almost as if like, you know, maybe the, the going back oddly enough and comparing it to what life was like when you were a kid uh, or, you know, growing up might have been the sort of, you got an apples to apples uh, sort yeah, of Yeah, no, I think, I think that's true. Also, in, in New York, I mean, one of the problems is with New York, I think, is that the, the creative class, the professional class, they all live together. And so therefore, if some, a lot of your friends and the people you see at parties and whatnot, even if you're not rich, and even if you're not working on Wall Street, our rich guys working on Wall Street, it's like, oh yeah, they're my friends. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. And they're kind of a dick in that way, but no, it's, it's all fine. I think life in New York at the upper reaches economically, uh, tends to uh, not serve the, the kind of uh, uh, clarity, if not radicalization, about the economic system that uh, you're talking about. But yeah, I think Omaha was probably part of it. That's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. But you know, also, my, I mean, Warren Buffett was was a friend of my parents. Didn't make him rich, but he was a friend of theirs. And and so, actually, that same trip to Omaha, I, I went and saw for the first time at this wonderful little bookshop in the airport there this shrine to Warren Buffett and all of his books and all this essentially, I mean, uh, created by this really smart guy who ran the bookstore. And, 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 and I began thinking about Warren Buffett and Warren Buffett as a very different kind of billionaire than say Donald Trump, well, Donald Trump's billions, but, but not, the, not the kind of, it's all about me and greed is good. He was a different kind of you know, investor and rich guy. And it was also right then which I also mentioned in the book, 2005, 2006, where Warren Buffett comes out more than once on television and says, you know, there is a class war. People, the right talks about this class war being waged. There is a class war. It's being waged by my side, by rich people, and we're winning and we shouldn't be. So yeah, those, all, all of those things together uh, were, were part of my, uh, uh, yeah, ra radicalization moment, you know, you know uh, uh, or if, if that's what we want to call it, yeah. And I will say that's also a defense as to why I have no friends uh, anywhere. And so I am not uh, susceptible to any of those. Uh, the, <laughs> but that's, that's, I want to talk wise. about that keeps you hygienic. Exactly. It, very, very hygienic, a little bit lonely, but uh, you, you work through that. So uh, so let me ask you this in terms of like the the y y y we, we talked about the idea of culture going back and um and, and feeding on the past, this sort of uh, this nostalgia, this kitsch, if you will. And, and, and you observe that the culture in many respects has been in a weird stasis for the past couple of decades. It, uh, talk about that, because, it, I mean, it does seem, I will say that the, the thing that has radically changed over the past 20 years, as far as I can tell, is technology and everything that is uh, in, implied by that, having a, a you know, a 14 year old daughter, I mean, I could, you know, the interesting thing about this whole COVID thing is that I feel like her whole life has been training to maintain her relationships over Zoom because that's what she was on some level. She was doing some version of that anyways. But but beyond that, there's there's no outward talk about that. That sort of yeah. outward representation. Well, that again, as it happens, it was a it was an epiphany that I had around the same time, six months later than this, era, you know, screwed over pilots one. And I was just reading the paper and I saw this picture from not from 20 years earlier, 21 years earlier, I think 1985 or six um, of, of people of, of, of this group of fashionable young people, waiters, maitre d's and so forth. who worked at this at the first cool boutique hotel in Manhattan. And I'm saying, how weird. They all look 
like people today. Their hair looks like it, their grooming thing, their clothes, the, the stuff on the street, everything. Like, that's weird because in any previous time in my lifetime, and then I realized before, 20 years made all the difference in the world, right? Everything in 1970 looked different, was, it looked, sounded, acted radically different than 1950. Same, 80, 1980 versus 1960, 1990 versus 1970. And then it stopped. And, and, and anyway, I didn't see it as part, I thought I saw this as at the time as this entirely other thing. And I, and I spent some time trying to figure that out, how, the, how and why that had happened. And, 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 and in some ways it is an extension of nostalgia. It's like, it, it, I, and why it, ha I think what, what, one reason it happens is because of all the wild technological change, some of it good, a lot of it not so good, all of it discombobulating uh, for a lot of people, it, there was a certain reassurance that, oh, but look, the way I dress and the way that magazine looks and, and the way that car looks and all of the rest, that's, and nothing's really that different, is it? It's kind of all like it always was. I mean, you know, look at you, Sam. I mean, you, you, you could walk down the street in 1990 and nobody would go, wow, look, man from the future. I'm you know, probably wearing the exact same clothes. I wore well, exactly, and and and, the best and so I think for that one of the reasons it happened, as I say, is is the same reason the nostalgia mania happened. It's like it's reassuring, but and I don't think anybody made it happen, or any any more than anybody made the nostalgia thing happen. But I do think, and this is how I began weaving it together with my the economic story, political story I tell. I think it has served to reinforce the idea that big change, radical change, re-engineering the economy say, is really not possible because everything just stays the same, doesn't it? And, and, and I, so I think it has that effect of, of making it seem impossible to change things, that this is just the way it is, kids. So, and again, I'm not saying that's even conscious on anybody's part, but I think, it's a, this strange thing that happened midway through the takeover by the evil geniuses that serves their interests. Yeah. How does that fit in? I'm just curious as to like, if you have a, a take on this in terms of generationally, because it seems that, uh, and I am, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I guess, uh, late generation X, early generation X, I'm at the margins of generation X and, um, uh, you know, closer to a boomer and, I wonder, you know, when I look at um, younger people, people in their 30s and younger, it, it feels like that there is not the same inhibition of imagination that exists certainly in my generation and amongst the, 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 the boomer generation. And I wonder if that is, um, uh, it, it, you know, like how much the... I guess like, you know, the boomers went to sort of like said, we're going to break off of the, the shackles of pretense and button up shirt and short hair. And there's nowhere to go after that for them. Right. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, once every day is casual Friday, <laughs> you've run out of days yeah. and uh, on some level, but like the younger people, they don't have that constraint on some level. Where, where, where does generation, what, 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 What's going on here generationally? Well, I, and and I'm hopeful. You know, I, I see I see green shoots of hope of maybe this stasis is not altogether, you know, any of, is, is gonna is gonna sustain itself. But I think, you know, I, I however, you know, the 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 radically new in in the ways in which hip hop was radically new in the 70s and 80s, or rock and roll was radically new in the 60s. We still haven't seen that. So, so whatever, you know, for instance, so whatever the generational difference is, it has yet to, in a cultural way, in a pop cultural way, manifest itself in a, in a, in a spectacular way like, like those. But I, I also think that because the younger generation, because anybody under 45 has never lived in anything but in America, an unfair, unequal, insecure economy. I, I think, you know, 
there's more of a sense of well, what have I got to lose, right. you know? Uh, and, I, so, and, and in, in, a, in, a, in so many good ways, uh, you know, potentially if, if, if the evil geniuses re- retain control, uh, it could explode and blow the whole thing up, which of course some young people, Sam, want to do. But, um, uh, you know, so I think that's part of it, uh, the, the difference. It, but, but the other thing, I mean, you know, I've got kids older than yours and, 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 and young people also, some of them anyway, love nothing more than using their Jetsonian technology to like look back at the 70s and the 60s and the 50s and look at videos and, you know, which is not bad in and of itself, but the, 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 the accessibility of images and sounds of the past uh, does have the effect, I think, of, 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 uh, uh, of suppressing the, the rejection of the past that big radical changes of the 60s and of 1848 and everything else before tended to, to occur. I mean, there has to be some kind of rejection of the past. And God knows we have a rejection of the racial past, racial oppression past and, and the misogynistic past and that's going good. But like, and I think in the last decade with the Bernieites and, and, and even Warrenites like me, uh, I think you, I, I, am, I am hopeful that there's, that people are seeing clearly, more clearly that uh, this, this, current, the way the system is, has been re-engineered, well, that it was re-engineered and that it was re-engineered not to serve most people. And it doesn't have to be this way, you know? Um, so we'll see. Uh, but it, it is, uh, you know, no, I, I am prodded and, ed- and educated and re-educated all the time by my, uh, my daughters. So Good luck with. I hope you are too. Yeah, I, I am indeed. And and I should say your your insistence on on using political economy uh, as opposed to just the the term economy is is yeah. one that I think sort of goes to the heart of 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 trying to remind people like these are choices. This is not uh, we're not we're not in an organic situation here. This is not about uh, this is not gravity or physics. This is simply people making a choice to to drop a hammer. That's why it fell to the ground. Exactly right. Um, all right. So lastly, where does, uh, and, and you end the book on, on, on a hopeful note and you give some suggestions as to how to move forward, but where, where does, how do you, I guess, um, digest, uh, metabolize Joe Biden as a, as, as our savior in this instance, I mean, I, I, maybe it's slightly overstated, but, but, but I mean, as the guy that is at the very least, you know, people are hoping will put an end at least to uh, Trump and then theoretically maybe, maybe open the door a tiny crack or something, or at least maybe make it, you know, unlock the door, not yeah. necessarily open it. I mean, where, where, how do you, how well, do you, you I mean, know? Because, you know, um, uh, what the right calls Trump derangement syndrome, I fully have. And until that first step is taken care of, I I can almost look no further. But in this book, I do because it's a book and I have to look at the future. So uh, I think Joe Biden, I think I think if the Democrats are elected, I think Biden and Harris are elected. And and if we if the Democrats take the U.S. Senate, that's a huge first step to beginning what needs doing. And, 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 and Joe Biden, you know, he, unlike some of the other people, I think, in these who are Democratic Party centrists, he's, he's I, I think he's less, it, my, my sense is that he's less ideologically centrist than he is just, I don't, I don't know if that's practical. Uh, you know, that he will move where his party has moved. And his party on these economic questions has moved obviously significantly to the left in the last decade. So, and, and what was, what, you know, the Obama administration in 2009 decided, no, we can't go for public option healthcare because that's too radical. Now is, is the Joe Biden position. So, so I am hopeful, I am hopeful that he, he as just a, I don't want to say as just a Democrat who puts his finger to the wind and does what Democrats want, because that can be a bad thing. I think in this instance, it's kind of a good thing. 
Um, uh, so I'm I'm hopeful. I I, I my first uh, you know great disappointment would be would come when we see who he appoints to be Treasury Secretary and head of the Office of Management Budget and all those jobs, and whether it's just you know more uh, you know Wall Street guys. Uh, uh, but 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 I'm no I'm hopeful and and, and also I. I a, th- a weird, a perverse thing that made me hopeful in the last few weeks is I went back and looked at, at Donald Trump's final big two minute campaign ad in 2016. And, and I swear to you, uh, it's worth looking at. You, it could be a Bernie Sanders commercial. He, he does, it's, it's, a, it's from a speech he gave is the voiceover. And it's all these scenes of Wall Street and bankers and Lloyd Blankfein and, and, and they have destroyed the working class in America and taken the wealth and given it. It's, 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 it's wild, right? And this is a guy who also campaigned on universal health care will be better than ever for you. You know, people voted for him for partly, many people, for those reasons, thinking, ah, he's not a Republican like those guys. Well, clearly that was his biggest lie of all. But my point in this conversation is that there is uh, uh, an audience for, a constituency for uh, g- greater economic fairness and, and, and greater scrutiny of Wall Street and big business that isn't, you know, just on the left. Uh, obviously, that was, that was part of the Bernie Sanders plan since, right. you know, for the last five years of running for president. But I, I think, you know, I think there's some truth to it. And I think if, 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 you know, if, if where the Democrats are now uh, uh, is embodied by Joe Biden, and I think that's, there's a fair shot of that happening, then, you know, it's one good, important, small step in that direction. Do you think people are going to, lastly, do you think people are going to stay engaged? I mean, one of the things that I remember after Bill Clinton get elect, got elected is that there was this sort of like collective sigh of relief that the Reagan era was over, including, you know, George Herbert Walker Bush. Same on some level with Obama. Bush is done. Good. We can move on. And then that means that, you know, I no longer have to look at the uh, politics section of 100%. whatever it is. And everybody, you know, uh, uh, you know the, that centrist Democrat. And, and I would say in the book, I just want to make clear, that people should know that you, you really hold, you you really recount the democratic sort of buy into all this stuff. I didn't know that stuff about Gary Hart and Arthur Laffer. Uh, that really, uh, I mean, I, it doesn't shock me knowing Hart's profile, but it sort of shocks me, uh, you know, like that anybody you. would, would uh, but, it, and even after, you know, what Laffer did in Kansas, we still have too much of Laffer, uh, is not, you know, uh, is not mocked enough, I think. But do you think that people, and I'm talking in many respects, people, my generation, your generation, are going to just basically say, Phew, no Donald Trump, now I can go back and uh, what's on uh, HBO this week? Uh, sure. And, and I think we should also remember that that is the way most Americans are about politics all the time, even now. You know, I mean, uh, I talked to friends of mine who are political reporters who are out in the field talking to all kinds of people uh, all the time, voters. And it's and they always remind me, like, you know, 60 percent or more of people just barely paid attention. And certainly until last week or this week, (laughs) haven't paid much attention. So so, yes, that is the default is to return to that mean, which is why, you know, the people who care are engaged like the right, the economic right d- did in the 70s and 80s, got to have well, people on the left need to look at this and have a, play a long game and keep at it. And the 10% or 20% or 30% or whatever who are engaged and care and aren't just going to be, oh my God, I don't have to think about Washington and the president anymore. And by the way, a lot of us who are engaged will also feel that a little bit. Um, but I think, uh, you know, there need, it needs to be a long game with clear principles that people keep pushing and keep pushing. Because one of the reasons, one of the things I realized after I mostly finished this book was that it is a, it is a, it, it, part of its purpose, perhaps, is a guidebook for what we can do now. Uh, and, 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 you know, and, and, and they <laughs> had a lot of, uh, uh, 
could, could do this more efficiently in, in lots of ways than the left could. They had corporations yeah, and it, it, was, it was an easier for these guys to execute on a long game. But I think there's lots of lessons here. And, and uh, you know, and, and, you know, people like uh, AOC, I think, to my mind, you know, she's, she is, uh, I, every time I say that she's not just, she's playing the long game, I, I feel like. I mean, and, and to hear her talk about, you know, what, how we need to, 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 to get ourselves ready for a fully automated AI future, she's, she is, she is, she's playing in many different lanes at once, and she's not such a, you know, oh, she's a zealot who will never compromise to, in order to govern. She's already shown to me that she's not that, and she has compromised, and she, she's, she's playing the game in a good way. So I, 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 you know, until I am rendered entirely hopeless for the first time in my life, which could happen on November 4th or whenever we find out who won, uh, I am, I am, you know, I am, I'm kind of hopeful. Kurt Anderson, uh, the book is Evil Geniuses, The Unmasking of America, A Recent History. Uh, folks can check that out. We will post it to a majority at IFM. Thank you so much for uh, your oh, time. It was, a, it was a pleasure. Uh, this was a great conversation. Well, thank you. All right. I appreciate it. All right, folks. I don't know why it took me so long. I should have, I mean, the first, the, the, he should have been the first guest on, uh, on the majority report with, with Janine and I, I mean, maybe not necessarily the first, but like uh, very early because turn of the century really captured the sort of craziness in uh, that was happening in New York city at that time. Yeah. Took a little bit of a different approach with him than you did with Stuart Stevens. Didn't you? I sort of let, uh, I let, I didn't hit him as hard as I hit Steve Stevens. Stuart Stevens. Hey, but Stuart Stevens says he wants to come back. So maybe, maybe next time uh, it'll be, um, maybe next time we can, we can, I don't know. I still have a couple of questions for Stuart Stevens. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, you get into the middle of it and I got my papers here and they get shuffled around and I'm like, I got to hit this point. I got to hit that point. You don't want to come right out the gate and go after the guy. I know there was a lot of people I heard were like, I, 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 I only listened for like the first four minutes. I was so disgusted. I had to turn it off. And then I went back list later and uh, you know, it, it, it got a little better, but the, but yeah, I, I, I got to admit, I'm a bigger fan of Kurt Anderson's than I am of Stuart Stevens. I'm not saying I don't like Stuart Stevens. I just don't know him. So, uh, folks, just a reminder, this program relies on your support. When you become a member of the Majority Report, you, you make the free show possible every single day. And then, as a way of saying thank you, we give you extra content every day. We originally started this. It was going to be 45 minutes free, 45 minutes uh, for the members. And then it just, you know, every moment up until as I'm preparing for the show is just uh, ranges from like tolerable to sometimes just pure misery. And then when the show starts, I enjoy it too much and I can't stop talking. And then I go back to just sort of like, uh, like tolerable after that, like at 3 p.m. That's basically... If you were to graph my my mood, it goes like it's just like this, and then maybe die, and then then just spikes, and then it's like. Anyways, you get an hour and a half for the uh, membership. <laughs> today, no, me today in the office was just a disaster. Like Matt, I had to like 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 I threw a fit. Like we you know we tested it out, and I threw a fit at like ten thirty. I'm like I can't do this. I just can't do it. And there's no having way I can do this. And uh, I flipped out and Matt's like, I'll come into the office. And I'm like, thank you. I think I probably even said that like in the, in the corner to myself, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, Wait, this is all technological me. stuff. This is like, this is, is what, this is all technology. I missed like part of this conversation. Yeah, I just you know, heard that you're miserable all the time. And then you're on air. I'm in the, the, the Brooklyn studio. Okay. And this got it. studio is not set up to do this remote thing. Oddly yeah. enough. My other studio is because that's all I would ever do from there is a remote. Right. So here, like, you know, I'm surrounded by all these cameras. And the only one that is actually relevant is this webcam that I put on top of this tripod. Yeah. And I got all these cables going all these different places. 
And the only one that's relevant is this one that like I patched together with like an old Radio Shack, uh, you know, thing that I soldered and put some duct tape around and that's the thing. And, and, and that's it. And so Matt had to come in and uh, save the day. And, um, and, and, and so that's that. So also, that you could see your guests, right? Is that the, that's the thing? That's happening. No, so it's not even them. so much to see a guest. It's the whole sound, routing the sound for the phones and all these different things. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got the phone. And there. like our Zoom setup, it's not really Zoom. It is Zoom, but it's we run it through fans, as you know, um, is, uh, you know, is different than being in the studio and yeah. in terms of the way that we go live. And so, you know, it, it's just like. This it, is I, why people need to give you money and us money so we can build better studios and well, then we can crowdsource it together and just have it for everyone yeah well well i mean that's what fan that's what kyle is doing with fans i mean the, he's, he's creating something that i think is going to be accessible to a lot of people and it's going to make it um uh much easier um and you know every day it feels like there's another feature that he adds that makes this possible but it's also very weird because we're planning for a future that we do not know mm -hmm. like i don't know we're going to be doing it this way for six months three months right. 20 months. Oh, okay. All right. We got to get going. I know you've got your show today at three and I don't want to bust through that uh, <laughs> today. Um, but I uh, just want to remind everybody AMQ, you can check out the AM quickie. It's free. You can sign up at amquickie.com. You can uh, check it out on our YouTube uh, page at majority report live. Uh, but you can find it on any of your podcast uh, things. And also don't forget justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority at 10% off. Those guys are movement uh, people. In addition to they, they're it's a co-op, uh, but they are um, you know in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, longtime movement uh, supporters of the show. Uh, the other day, I was talking about the Cernovich thing to somebody, and it was basically just coffee that saved saved me. Uh, uh, yeah, they get Cernovich sent um, fake emails to all the sponsors, and I had no way of knowing this, and uh, until. I mean, saying I think what? we, were, huh? Saying what? What were the fake email like? It was oh, like during the person? whole thing where it, like yeah. Sam Cedar supports child rapists, and right. I'm a member of Child Rapist Survivors, you know, association, and uh, it scared a lot of advertisers. I understand this. I mean, they're not in that business, but the one advertiser, I got an email immediately from Just Coffee, and they're like. I don't buy this <laughs> sort of itch. And like, cause these guys, they're fans of the show They're And by guys, I mean, guys and girls, guys and gals, um, folks, folks, Sam, folks. I, I just, I refer to everybody as guys. Like I say that my daughter refers to me as girl and I refer to her as guy, <laughs> um, like guy, come on. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> like I sent her a video the other night, last night. And she's like, girl, I saw this in 2012. Like, oh. she literally said girl I saw yeah. yeah she texted me she's like girl i saw this in 2012 i'm like all right, all right. she's not doing it ironically this is like literally just like girl girl get yeah, with it she's, she's just, that's like the way she talks um and uh but the just coffee people contacted me and that's what got everything in motion and then matt actually had to run into studio that night too but that's a different story <laughs> no matt. what's Same going thing. on <laughs> <laughs> I'm building out a Murphy bed for Matt. Here. <laughs> Tell me what's going on with you. Um, I have also been dealing with technology issues. I am way less sophisticated than you are when it comes to this, but we are uh, very exciting news today. We go daily, sort of daily Tuesdays through Fridays. We are uh, going to have our show one hour, 3 PM Eastern to 4 PM Eastern. And uh, today's show, we are talking about evictions, and we're talking about the police. Two very important topics. Chris Brown, who's an attorney who um, has done a lot of activism around protecting victims of police brutality. He's going to give us a little bit of an update on what's actually going on. Are, are there any reforms happening? And then uh, later we have uh, Representatives Chris Rabb from Pennsylvania and Representative uh, uh, Mike Conley from Massachusetts to talk about the eviction crisis and if anything is moving anywhere in any legislature. And these are two extremely progressive represent, probably the, some of the most I am aware of um, in this country. What district is Connolly? He isn't. Oh, oh, state, state, state rep. Rep, state rep, yeah. Uh, okay, okay, okay. I don't know off the top of my head, but he's a democratic socialist. He was a member before he ran. 
he got elected in 2016, and Representative Rabb has the highest turnout in Pennsylvania. He's by far the most left candidate in Pennsylvania, or elected in Pennsylvania. Someone, a rising star, I think, you know, he's back from like the Netroots days. I'm surprised you did. Do you know him, Chris Rabb? I, I, feel, I feel like I do. Yeah. I feel like he I do. He used to like blog back know, in the day. I can't remember. I can't remember anything anymore. <laughs> what was the name of the guy who uh, I was talking about before? Oh, Matt. Matt, what uh, what's happening on TMBS tonight? <laughs> uh, tonight on TMBS, we have a conversation with Milton Alamadi of Black Star News. We're talking about the coup in Mali. Uh, Ori Museveni, the Ugandan president, he's attacking his political opponent, uh, uh, Bobby Wine, saying he's 40 and say, um, while well, he's passed himself off as 38. Um, and so we talk about that sort of uh, what's going on with elections in Uganda. Uh, and then, yeah, we also will touch on Kenosha and a bit more. So that's uh, tonight on TMBS, patreon.com slash TMBS and uh, the Michael Brooks show on YouTube. You got to fix that uh, internet, Pat, if you're going to try and do that tonight. Oh, it's my internet, Pat? Okay. You're getting a little bit of like that wow, wow, wow thing. Um, <laughs> all right, we're going to take a quick break, head into the fun half. Uh, the number is 646-257-3920. We will take your phone calls. We will take some IMs. Uh, and see you there. Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous. You're a little bit uh, upset. You're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> Some good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight. 56, 27, one half, five eighths, 3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left wing Limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grand Paul. I had my first post coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want. To drive to the library, <laughs> what you're talking about is jibber jabber. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. You guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> uh, ooh. Wow. Um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. We are back. Sam Cedar on the uh, majority board. For some reason, my Zoom now asks me if I'm okay with you unmuting me, Matt. I'm not sure why. Yeah, I can no longer unmute you. I don't get why. Why? why? I don't know. And now you can mute. You can unmute yourself with the space bar momentarily. So there, there's changes, I guess. Every day. Right. Every day. 
it's such a thing because you like for me I'm obviously not in studio I have to like lean over get into the camera's face press on mute it's just well, you got to get an extended um are you on a laptop I am well I have a mouse now but it still makes clicky noises and <laughs> you got to get one of these bad boys oh that, yeah that's from like Track- the 90s. yeah, yeah. I don't know if they make those anymore, Sam. Are you serious? No, oh, no, they definitely do. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, I, I, all the equipment that we have in this office, I just go back and I'm like, what was two generations ago? I'm going to buy that on eBay. That's the way that that works. <laughs> and that's why, like, I desperately hit every computer. Like, do you want to, uh, uh, you know, update? Absolutely not. Can't. <laughs> Cannot. And that is why. Matt is called into the office every day and is getting a Murphy bed. That is one of the reasons why. Not not the only reason. <laughs> um, so uh, here is Donald Trump. What did we play? Uh, what was that clip that we played? We did. Oh, no, we never did, did we? Uh, let's play that clip of uh, Donald Trump. Was that uh, talking about the... Um, Donald Trump, of course, is still dealing... And, and, and I, you know... I'm not going to vote against Donald Trump because um, he disparaged the uh, the soldiers. Um, in many respects, I don't know. His disparagement was uh, really questioning a dynamic that I've questioned. That like, hey, the civilian leadership doesn't care, um, uh, you know, about the military personnel that it sends to war, uh, because far too often we send those people to war for for no reason. No reason that in any way benefits them or protects the country, but it protects the interests of uh, very uh, wealthy people. Um, however, I am not like a very large swath of voters in this country for whom hearing that Donald Trump called the war dead suckers and losers um, I mean, apparently that uh, cemetery that he refused to go to, I can't go access the uh, the name of it now, but the Marines who were buried there, apparently that battle was, and there was something like 60% of the Marines in that battle were killed. Jesus. That battle has, um, has resonated for a century in the Marine Corps. And um, the fact that he didn't go to that cemetery and for the reasons that people are now speculating, um, let me put it this way. The Trump people, the Trump campaign is very worried about the fallout of this. I don't know if they're accurate or not, but he is still on it. Here he is saying, actually, the soldiers doesn't say, well, Marines, but uh, the he says the soldiers uh, love him, but not the Pentagon officials. And I guess he's talking about maybe the the, the generals, of course. Yeah. Um, turned on him. The generals, you know, he appointed Mike Espy, who's the head of the Pentagon, who is, just to remind you, I don't know, is he still actually a um, uh, a, a armaments uh, 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 executive, or did he actually resign that position to take, uh, here's Donald Trump. Shipped away our jobs, threw open our borders, and sent our youth to fight in these crazy, endless wars. And it's one of the reasons the military, I'm not saying the military is in love with me. The soldiers are. The top people in the Pentagon probably aren't because they want to do nothing but fight wars so that all of those wonderful companies that make the bombs and make the planes and make everything else stay happy. But uh, we're getting out of the endless wars. You know how we're doing. We defeated 100 percent of the ISIS caliphate, 100 percent. When I was in, when I came in, it was a mess. It was all over. They have it in a certain color, all ISIS. <laughs> a year later, I said, where is it? It's Beautiful all gone, map. sir. Because of you, Thank you for color gone. coding it. Because of my philosophy, but be, it all gone. I said, that's good. Let's bring our soldiers back home. Some people don't like to come home. Some people like to continue to spend money. What? One cold-hearted globalist. Pause it for one second. After another, no. that's what it was. Pa- pause it for one second. One of the reasons why you want to bring the soldiers uh, and the military home is because uh, of the, you know, the lifestyle. Maybe they might want to see their families or whatnot. Right. But it's because of the money. They don't like to save it. I don't know. It's good. Continue. Uh, 
that's the clip. Oh, that's it. All right. And so, I mean, here he is. He appointed Mark Esper to Secretary of uh, Defense. He is literally a former, I mean, I, I think he's former, right? He was the uh, executive, I don't know, vice president. He was a lobbyist for the Aerospace Industries Association. He was um, <clears throat> president of the Global Intellectual Property Center. He was a, a lobbyist for Raytheon. Right. I mean, this is the guy he's talking about. He's the most qualified. Yeah. The guy that he put in charge. Well, I think what's strange about that is on one hand, he's talking about soldiers and how the soldiers love him. And then he's blaming soldiers for wanting to stay overseas. It's not the Pentagon no, officials blaming. who are going overseas. to spend That's my money. point. He's blaming. He's saying yeah. that the generals want to keep them there because they're in bed with the defense contractors. Right. And he literally appointed a defense contractor to head the Pentagon. There, there's like an investigation right now. We covered this on the show a couple of weeks ago where there's an investigation um, where a bunch of, of Kurdish oligarchs were getting paid off by Pentagon officials. And these guys took the money and bought real estate like mansions in Beverly Hills. This is literally directly related to the people that he appointed. And it's it's being investigated. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, here's the thing is that and this is, you know, this is what sort of strikes me on some level. It's sort of fascinating. Donald Trump can get out there and talk about how he's against the military industrial complex. But when push comes to shove, he's, of course he's not. I mean, of course he's not. Why can't we have at least, uh, you know, why can't we get Joe Biden to at least, you know, pay lip service to be against the uh, d defense contractors? So I, I got an email right before I came on. It was, I'm sure you're getting these emails from random people who are fundraising and bundling money for Joe Biden, right? No, you don't get, I don't I even know who this answer, person is. But I don't, maybe I do, I don't know. I don't know who this guy is, but I'm on his email list. And it's, there is a logo. This is how thought out it is. It's a very cheesy logo. It is called the Unofficial Volunteers Patriots Team 2020 G.I. Joe. And it's an entire email about how they're raising money. And it's like, I assume this might be like a, a veteran who's raising money from other vets. I'm not really sure how I got on this list. But there's a logo and branding around G.I. Joe Biden. So they're leaning in. Um, somehow they raised $400,000. There's a ton of fundraisers around this. It's cuckoo. I mean, it's totally cuckoo. Well, you know, again, I mean, I think, um, you know, I understand why people, um, you know, would be less than enthusiastic. Um, you know, I understand why people would be enthusiastic, too. Uh, Joe Biden has got to win. If it's if if you don't like to get emails like that, and but you want to make sure that he wins, like I say, there's a lot of great candidates out there or, or you know, give money to the uh, Wisconsin Democratic Party. Give money to uh, the Michigan uh, Democratic Party. Give money to the Pennsylvania uh, Democratic Party. Um, or give money to uh, candidates that, um, you know, local candidates that you like. Because every time you do that, they're going to bring people to the polls. Exactly. And those people, more often than not, are going to end up voting for Joe Biden. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, the there is a... The, the academic research shows there is a like, you know, a reverse um, uh, coattail effect for this stuff. And so, um, I mean, that's where, you know, that's that's the way that I deal with with that with that type of thing. And in a lot of these states, Pennsylvania, I think next week, early voting starts. Yep. It started uh, last week. I think it was in um, North Carolina, maybe. Yeah. I think so, so uh, yeah. Get on it, folks. If you can go vote, go vote. Um, the other thing that continues, like I say, this this is, at the very least, this is, you know, this is lasting now three or four or five days, six days, more, a week. This revelation, uh, this uh, report by um, Jeffrey Goldberg, I guess, in The Atlantic, that, um, I don't know, there was a Fox News reporter who confirmed a lot of this. I mean, you know, who knows? Um it's not hard to imagine that Donald Trump said these things, I don't know, but the most important aspect of this is that Donald Trump feels like he's got to deal with it. Yeah. 
And here he is on the defensive. Uh, very, he seems like in a very bad mood talking about John McCain again. Again, I was never a fan of John McCain's, um, but I also was never going to vote for Donald Trump. But there are some people who voted for Donald Trump who were fans of John McCain's. Not many, I would imagine, but some. Uh, and here is uh, Trump being asked about John McCain and getting a little pissy about people wearing masks. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the issue of what happened when you were in France continues to be a story. You're going to have to take that off, please. Just, you can take I'll, it off. You're, you're, how, how many feet are you away? I'll speak a lot louder. Well, if you don't take it off, you're very muffled. <laughs> so if you would take it off, it would be a lot easier. I'll, I'll just speak a lot louder. Is that better? It's better, yeah. Mr. It's better. Mr. President, some people are having a hard time believing your denial of the Atlantic story because of what you said about John McCain in the past. Do you understand that? And have you asked John, no, I don't understand and have you asked John Kelly to refute that story? Yeah, no, I don't understand it at all, no, because I've always been on the opposite side of John McCain. John McCain liked wars. I will be a better warrior than anybody, but when we fight a war, we're going to win them. And frankly, I was never a fan of John McCain. You know that. It's been very obvious. I was, but I had to approve his entire his funeral. I wanted him to get. He deserved a first class. You know, it all was approved by me. We sent Air Force One to pick up the casket, a lot of things. But no, I was not a fan of John McCain because he wanted the endless wars. And I didn't. I thought that the way the vets were taken care of. Pause it for one second. Was Pause it for one second. Everybody knows that it's not like he paid for it. Right. We we sent we sent Air Force One. It's not like he paid for like I paid for it. This is a tax dollars that paid for this. I but I I I couldn't go to uh, I couldn't go to my country club uh, exactly in the time because I said pick up the casket, whatever. So it's He's an Air it, for, not Air Force Two Air Force. So one. aggrieved. It's so very aggrieved. generous. Yeah. Well, let's play that the way the vets were taken care of, our great vets, was not good, not appropriate. And, of course, he took the fake, dirty dossier and gave it over to the FBI. So this is not somebody I'm supposed to say, what a wonderful guy. So, you know what? I lived with him. He lived with me, but we had different philosophies. I think... There you go. <laughs> I wonder if he's implying that. I mean, then he double-crossed me, and that's why he died. <laughs> Just that's why he, that's why he's not with us anymore. I did it. I'm not saying I did it. I'm just saying that you don't mess with me or you die. <laughs> I I think there's like also this other aspect of this where John McCain becoming such a prevalent figure in this election. I mean, I, I think that like look at the Arizona polls right now. That's interesting to me. Like he he needs Arizona to win. McSally is getting crushed. Right now by Mark Apparently, Kelly. McSally lost a lot of um, support when she oddly suggested that her supporters skip a meal to give her five bucks or something uh, for her campaign. That seems, that is like, ask not what uh, I can do for you. Ask what you can do for me. But yeah, continue about Arizona. No, I was just, I mean, that's basically it, is that you have this, it's, it's already a kind of an independent streaking. It's not... It's not traditional Republicans. They exist. There are Trumpians there. But I think a big chunk of it is, I mean, there are more independents registered or there were a few years ago than Democrats or Republicans. And, and you know, he's still extremely popular. So I think the McCain family leaning in on this election is probably going to hopefully affect the Senate, hopefully affect the presidential race, too, as Arizona has been in play for how long? I mean, yeah. what a great move by by Biden whether it was strategic or not, is getting the most popular family in Arizona to support you in your election in a state that you've been trying to move for over a decade. Yep. Yep. Um, also, Raytheon is based in Arizona. Is it? Well, one of their, yeah. Huge, huge, huge. Uh, let's uh, go to A Square. On the I am. I'm still catching up on last week's shows, but looking forward to hearing you with Stevens. Trevor Noah actually had a good, a hard exchange with him in one of his shows, but sure, not as good as yours. Good interview with Cloud, too. Thank you. Speaking of Eddie Cloud, 
Uh, Space Lennon, first day of distance learning school was supposed to start today in Sumner and Bonnie Lake. Washington canceled due to wildfires. Oof. Town that put out power for thousands. The future is so fun. Whoa. Assy McGee, damn Sammy, always bringing that wet ass A word. Have you tried getting Ben Shapiro to debate? He's fake confident enough to say yes, I'm sure of it. I don't know. Have we tried formally? I don't know. Uh, P word, what will happen to Trump supporters if Trump loses? Will they find a new messiah or will they stick with Trump until they die? Well, I don't know. You know, it's interesting. There, you know, we, we were talking last week and uh, I've been on this sort of like kick about a little worried about violence. I'm worried about violence on the day of election through the period of time where, you know, we're waiting to get results. It's conceivable, I guess, that um, Joe Biden gets enough votes on that day that he could win. But I don't, you know, I, I, I think it's unlikely. I think we're not going to know who the winner is. And I think there's going to be a lot of violence in an attempt to sort of like uh, prevent people from counting the ballots. And, um, you know, well, who knows? There was this weird thing, too. Like, did you hear about this? Like, the this video of somebody dumping postal uh, letters, like it was in L.A. or something. I don't, I mean, um, they're, they're investigating it. But you just wonder, like, you know, the, the various different sort of means in which uh, people could interfere with the counting of the ballots and, and whatnot. And Apparently, there are also uh, groups on the left who are sort of meeting and contemplating uh, what happens with violence after the fact. Donald Trump is not going away. I mean, he could pass away at one point, uh, but he also strikes me as one of those guys who's going to live until like way past the time that he should. And um, he's going to, he'll, he'll, you know, go on own or whatever it is. I mean, do people remember how prominent um, what's her face uh, was? Um, uh, I can't even remember her name now, but she was hugely prominent. Uh, McCain's running mate, Sarah uh, Palin. Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin. Sorry, <laughs> Sarah Palin had a show. Was up. the like premier conservative uh, in the country for at least six to eight months after the election, mm -hmm. and then she just decided I need to cash out and get money. But you know, Donald Trump has figured out how to monetize this. Uh, if he goes to jail, it may be a different story, but he's not going to go to jail immediately. Um, he's going to get out there and he is going to, the, the, the dynamic is really not going to change that much. Um, he is going to help basically threaten to primary all these Republicans. It's going to be a fascinating dynamic because it's going to force the Democrats. Hopefully, hopefully Chris Coons is desperately doesn't want to get rid of that filibuster. Uh, because with the filibuster, you know, but there's still going to be a bunch of those guys who try and put themselves at the fulcrum. Right. But they're, they're, you know, uh, and, and, and she did Sarah Palin, like we forget how much she played a part in the tea party, how she became their, their weapon, their spokesperson. Without a doubt. There's going to be some, there is going to be on day one, Donald Trump is going to, you know, He's going to be monetizing it like she was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. So. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Republicans didn't find a way, like the, the Republican Party didn't find a way to use his movement now to focus more on legislative seats, more on 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 actual like, because right, you know, from, from his perspective, it's about winning the presidential election. So he's not using his power, his movement to target strategically below president. But if he doesn't win there's a great vehicle there in round 9,500 of Republicans, you know, rat fucking essentially. But is that, but is there, but is there evidence that, that the, the, that the, the organization is distinct enough from him that, that it can, it can help other candidates. I mean, like even when he endorses, I feel like there is a quality to Trump, like there was to Obama in terms of like, you know, Obama, did not have the ability to necessarily like sort of say like, you know, elect this person and get that yeah. person elected. I mean, I don't know that Donald Trump has that ability. He um, might. I mean, if he, if and I don't he, think he's going to deploy it in that way. If he does. I have no idea what his, his end goal will be or who around him is, is going to be advising. I mean, not in jail advising him, but I think there's more of a path the way Bernie created 
a movement and his in weighing in in certain elections to get people up and off the ground with the money and, and the resources and support. And, you know, and if, if, if he's working with Bannon, if he's working with these folks still, I, I don't know. But do you I think mean, he even has a political agenda? I have a feeling that it's more going to be like, so. You guys got to tune into own. And if you watch for four hours, you're going to get a, uh, you know, a mug and oh, also support that guy because he watches own, you know, like, or whatever the network is going to be. Maybe, but I think he probably wants to restore his image if he's, if he's out and maybe that's involved with own and, in, 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 you know, pushing out a conspiracy theory. I have no idea. I mean, they're, he, if he's, if he's voted out, that is, he's Nixon. So how does he not become Nixon? And his ego drives everything. So, and probably his his children are going to want to restore their family image to whatever level they can. Yeah, we'll restore. see about that. I don't know. I, uh, well, I hope we get the chance to see it. Let's put it that way. Um, this is a uh, this story broke over the weekend. I think it was a uh, long weekend. So, Louis DeJoy, understand? Off the top of my head, I can name a couple of people who've gone to jail for this. Right, Dinesh D'Souza. Mm -hmm. He had a couple of camp uh, contributions, like 10, 30, maybe 10, 20, $30,000 from three different people that he actually gave the money to those people to give because he wanted to be able to bundle money for somebody. Right. Um, who else did uh, fell prey to this? There's been others. I can't remember, but they go to jail. They go to jail. Um, Dinesh D'Souza? Well, I, I said D'Souza. Uh, Dinesh D'Souza, but there was somebody else who recently, I, I can't remember who it was, but you're not allowed to say like, hey, give money to this candidate, I'll kick you back the money. But, cause I've already maxed out, right. let's right. say. You're not allowed to do that, it is illegal. Now it's true, we don't have a federal election committee anymore, but this is this is like, this is a, a US Attorney General uh, prosecutes this. This is a, this is a crime, right. you can go to jail for this. And apparently, well, the Washington Post reported that Louis DeJoy and his uh, his uh, crew, it's his aides, urged employees at his former North Carolina-based logistics company to write checks and attend fundraisers on behalf of Republican candidates, a whole swath of them. And then, this is according to the Washington Post, he defrayed those costs. I mean, this is a very weird way of putting it. Uh, by boosting employee bonuses. So he would probably like, you know, you donate the max 2,500, you're going to get a bonus of three grand. It's like one step removed. He didn't give you, he didn't straight up give him the money. It was through incentives. I mean, you know, it doesn't seem that removed to me. Uh, think about this, Sam, like, you know, how many law firms do this? You, I mean, on both sides, they'll have lawyers, you're, you're, you're asked to go to these events Everyone in the room has to give 250 bucks, 1000 bucks, 10,000 bucks, whatever it is. I mean, you don't think that those lawyers that firm aren't listening to the the partners and thinking it's going to influence if they say no, is it going to influence their ability to to move up? I, I mean, that is like you're not allowed to do that and you're not allowed to reimburse them. And I don't know if these people got reimbursements. Like, you know, the way you could yeah. check is like, "Hey, how come you got a bonus on this election year and not that uh, the bonus there?" But um it is apparently we're outside of the federal statute of limitations on this, but not the North Carolina statute of limitations. And here is um, Louis DeJoy. Um, and he, and, and I should say that the house Democrats are launching an investigation of this. Uh, Carolyn Maloney said the house committee on oversight and reform would begin an investigation. She's the chair of that. Here is DeJoy. Um, he is being asked specifically, this is about two weeks ago, I guess, if he ever did this. And he said, no. Oh, and incidentally, it's a crime to lie to uh, Congress. Well, Mr. DeJoy, as a mega donor for the Trump campaign, you were picked along with Michael Cohen and Elliot Broiding, two men who have already pled guilty to felonies, to be the three deputy finance chairman of the Republican National Committee. Did you pay back several of your top executives for contributing to Trump's campaign by bonusing or rewarding them. That's an outrageous claim, sir, and I resent it. I'm just asking a question. The answer is no. 
So you did not bonus or reward any of your executives? No. no. Anyone that you solicited for a contribution to the Trump campaign? No, sir. Not in whole or in part? To, to be, uh, uh, actually, I, uh, during the Trump campaign, I wasn't even working at my company anymore. Mm. Well, we want to make sure that campaign contributions well, are legal. So all your campaign I'm contributions fully aware are legal. Of what, I'm fully aware of legal campaign contributions. Well, what if and I resent the assertion, sir. What well, are you accusing me of? Well, I'm asking a question. Now, it's interesting uh, Cooper sort of dropped the ball here a little bit back he then sucked. by making it uh, a little narrow. <laughs> like, you know, the question is like, have you ever in, in any instance, um, that will probably be the way that Louis DeJoy tries to get, well, I didn't do it for the, uh, for the Trump campaign. That's what he was asking. He said, Trump campaign. I wasn't but, working um, there during the Trump campaign. Cooper sucked. You know, you know what's fascinating about watching that is, study that and you get a sense of just how well some people lie right i mean i'm outraged i am outraged are you really asking what are you saying sir well everybody knows what he's saying mm-hmm. um it's fascinating to watch someone lie like that but it also shows i mean he was so defensive that i don't even know if it was effective like whoever is training him i i think it just makes him seem affected by it and guilty Seem guilty. Uh, wh- wh- what? I've never. What are you talking about, man? What are you talking about? Yeah, exactly. Call him from a 917 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? 917? Hello, is this me? Yeah, it is. Where are you calling from? Who is Hi. it? Where are you calling I'm from? calling from Brooklyn. This is Paul. I'm calling from Brooklyn, New York. Paul from Brooklyn, New York. What's on your mind, Paul? From Brooklyn, New York. So I work at a public school in Brooklyn Oof. called a tech. Yeah. And um, so yeah, today was supposed to be our first day back in the school building. And at 3 p.m. yesterday, we found out we are not going in because our school is being used as a rec center, um, which were supposed to close last Friday, but they got extended to this Friday. Um, and then on top of that, we also got a... Um, like a report about the like the HVAC systems and we can't really read them like at an advanced level, but it seems like some of the rooms are like not very good for um, teachers to be in. Right. Um, so we're just kind of not really sure even what day we're going to be back in the building. So that's just kind of where we're at. It's, it's a huge mess. I mean, for people who are outside of New York, originally this Thursday was going to be the start of school both remote or the what they call the blended, which is like a hybrid. And that would have been two days, one week, three days, the other week. And then they pushed that uh, a week for the start of everybody. And then they pushed the actual hybrid another five days to the 21st. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, we're, we're also we're also finding that a lot of our um, students are choosing to go remote now. So there's going to be a lot of teachers who will be working in the building, but they'll be, um, you know, teaching a remote classroom. Uh, an entire remote classroom? Yeah, it seems like it. Well, I mean, if they're in the building and there's nobody else in the office, it's a lot less, it's a lot safer than, you know, it's not as safe, obviously. Yeah, no, it's, doing it's, it's a homes. good thing. It just kind of highlights how maybe we should have stayed remote just a little longer and held out just a bit. I mean, I personally... I've I've said this a hundred times. I think uh, for uh, high school and middle school kids should have been remote from day one. You just do it, you eat it, and and you try and develop a a a, a good program for kids that age because they can sit in front of a computer and they can learn and they can do synchronized uh, learning. In terms of the elementary school kids, if it were up to me, and I know the union looked at this, but I'm unclear why they couldn't pull it off. Um, I would have taken every facility in the, you know, uh, that the DOE has uh, control over and I would have put elementary school kids throughout these buildings um, and put them in high school classes, put them in junior high classes, and they'll have two teachers. They'll have their, their elementary school teacher will go into that room. And then on the days that they're not 
with the elementary school teacher because these classes are smaller and so you'd need to uh, put them in different classes. They'll have like a proctor uh, who is a high school or middle school teacher and, um, and, and will be watching them. Or you hire, I don't know, teaching assistants just to help them uh, do their remote learning. But um, that's not what happened, so. But like he, what he said about the HVAC, um, reports and NPR are talking about how a lot of these schools, they're not having the, the it's just not being installed properly. Like I mean, the, there's, the no, there's no, and I mean, we also, uh, like how we, can we also people have expect a lot of this to happen? These buildings are so old. So old. And, so and these systems are so old to, to retrofit all of these buildings in two months. It's just, it's just, you can't do it. It's insanity. And you cannot do it, particularly when we have no money. I mean, the federal government could have mobilized and it would have been, you know, just another like a great project. You could have retrofitted these things. You could have like done it in a uh, in, in a good way. I'm sure a lot of these sc- uh, classrooms needed it and schools needed it. You could have poured a ton of money in and in just a different world. That's what would have happened. But, but then it would Betsy DeVos couldn't buy them up and privatize them later. So, that's right. You know. Appreciate well, the she could have used the Hang government to pay. Thank Hang in there. I Thank appreciate, you. you know, I understand what you're going through, and it's it, I, I, my my uh, my heart goes out to you. Spay F on the IM. Oregon is on fire right now. It is nearly dark from all the smoke. Yeesh. God, man. I wish I had some good news for today. The fires, air quality, Bueller, Anybody? No. Nope. You know, you know, on the school thing, real quick, I I was reading this. Uh, someone posted something on on who's a teacher, and that they're spending all their energy right now preparing meals and just putting them on buses, and they're not even they're not even bringing the kids into school. They're just using the transports to deliver food to kids' homes who would get that food, those meals, by going to school. And in some cities, this is like seventy percent of students get their meals from, or some yep. form of meal, a part of them. Well, meal that's good that they together. figured that out. That's a good system, I think. I mean, here is Brian Kilmeade lamenting what we're all lamenting, but doesn't seem to understand. He's looking for like, if only we had one entity that was giving us some type of consistent message. Hmm. I wonder what that could be. Gym owners and gyms are going down. One out of every six small businesses in this country are going to go out of business because politicians are, they claim, playing it safe or they playing it politics. And I think more and more every day that it is flat out politics. Because, for example, even in my town, there's one county that is playing sports. One mile away, they're not allowed to play sports. In certain areas, they're saying, play sports with masks. In club sports, they're saying, don't play sports with masks. In some schools, they say, you go back to school. In other schools, uh, we're not going to test. Other schools, we're going to test, but everyone goes back full time. We got to get on the same page and stop stop using uh, politics for school and business. And while every politician that makes these rules up gets paid. What? <laughs> Politicians are getting paid, and apparently they're making rules that keep people from working. Uh, and he wants a consistent message across politicians. And of course, he also he's, he's sort of implying that what I want that message is to be like there is no coronavirus and don't worry about it. But yeah, he's right. We need a consistent message. We need, uh, and and the only place that come from is from the federal government. Um, or Fox and, News. Or Fox News. But, uh, and even Fox can't deliver a consistent message. Mm-hmm. But there should be. We, we should have a federal government that is basically giving very specific um, guidelines. But if they are. Actually, they are. The CDC well, is. Uh, this is what is I don't it, understand. Though, they keep backing off the of stuff because the, the Trump administration gets pissed at it. And so, like, you know, nobody can trust the CDC. Uh, nobody is trusting the CDC. From day one, they've been undermined. From day one, people have had questions as to whether they're doing it. They've got, you know, uh, and, and there's reason to be suspect of, of of the CDC. They dropped the ball early on on this. And in part, we don't know if it's a function of like, the president does not want you to become alarmist. We don't want you to go out there and say this stuff. And if the federal government had been consistent from day one, if it was consistent even on day 100 or day 200, I mean, 
there's no there's no consistent message of look the all the openings they were promoting went against the cdc that's, uh guidelines that's what i'm saying like i don't think i mean yes the message has shifted over time for many reasons the cdc not understanding the science not uh you know being undermined uh not taking the threat seriously from the beginning but i think right now it's pretty damn clear it's pretty damn clear you have to have mask ordinances if you decide to move anything inside it has to be in limited size and you have to have air filtration systems and the science is out on this and even that is taking a huge risk it's politicians who are resisting you want to talk about long island brian kilmeade where he lives it's like well maybe it's because it's full of a bunch of republicans who are business owners that's right. the conflict he is making a cover he's having a conversation over business owners who are struggling financially and the the real threat of coronavirus and how they deal with it and so he, he doesn't have a message is how do you keep businesses alive and protect people and maybe that's where the actual message is lost in government because they're doing nothing Right. And, 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 and it's weird that they're in three separate windows when they're all sitting together on the couch. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, isn't the point here is like, why are people, you know, wearing masks at these things? It's ridiculous. Why aren't they in, in studio? How about you lead by example, exactly. Brian Kilmeade, go into studio, sit next to your co-hosts, right. have your makeup person come in, put your makeup on, have your hairstylist come and style and primp your hair. And uh, have the camera guys and the sound people and everybody else oh, live live your convictions. Be the change that you seek. That's what I'm saying to Brian Kilmeade. <laughs> Be the change that you seek. Um, meanwhile, we've got some uh, clips. Uh, Tim Pool, uh, Dave Rubin's back from his uh, his month long vacation. Make a big deal of that. He's going on Fox all the time now. He's like full on. He's doing a daily show now for uh, for uh, Glenn Beck. He has. Um, you know, Dave Rubin's really, in many respects, really come out of the closet uh, and basically concedes that he's like a full on conservative at this point. He's going to vote for Trump and whatnot. And but here's the thing. Regardless of the fact that uh, Dave Rubin has embraced his actual uh, political ideology, finally. The thing that he's yet to come to grips with, and he's still struggling, is that he's just not that bright. And so what he really should be doing is not saying much. He should just be asking questions, just sort of like hang back. But uh, here he is. Um, this is Dave Rubin. This goes back, what, this is from June of 2018, uh, of, of 2020, I should say. And Dave Rubin, um, we just got around to watching this because, you know, we don't spend too much time watching Dave Rubin. Uh, but watch this. He is sitting there with Lewis Howe. Who is Lewis Howe, guys? Oh, he's like an inspirational uh, speaker, writer. He's like a former athlete. I oh, was invited to his book party like five years ago. I can't believe I'm telling you this. Well, well, there you go. No, I mean, I don't know, but that's how I know who he is. That's it. Here's the idea. Does he end up signing bills that increase the debt and the rest of it? Yeah, because the whole system is, is out of whack. There's no money left, and yet we keep, okay, more stimulus. We have literally no money. We're so, how much debt are we in right now? Trillions and trillions of dollars, and it's going up. I think we just signed another $2.2 trillion stimulus. It's like, the how number, we, how do we get out? Well, I hate to tell you. Are we going to get out of this? Or is it just, you saw, yeah. don't bank can it I, can, I whisper, can I whisper how we get out? I mean, it's called war. The, the, the sad truth is we are, it seems to me that we're in an almost un- avoidable conflict with China now. They have so much of our debt that we know we can never pay it back. There's there's nothing, like short of like some sci-fi, we, we find a planet somewhere that has unobtainium like in Avatar right. and we mine it and sell it to the Chinese here. Although we would get in a war over who's gonna get there first. Like there are debtors and we've got more weapons than our debtors right now. That That's, I mean, talk about a mafia move. It's like, we sort of know, ah, we can keep borrowing from them because we got all the nukes and, you know, they've got what? some stuff, but, you know, we've got bases everywhere. It's a seriously depressing, like, unpleasant thing to think. They but got it, more people. Can't they just create more well, weapons and have more They got more and... people. I suspect they're probably cloning people, too. That's a whole, oh whole other thing. I mean, we know we can clone dogs and, oh my you know, God. we can clone yeah. sheep yeah. and we can clone, yeah, all that kind of stuff. And it's like, if we can Why? clone dogs right now, which we, you, there's commercial cloning of dogs happening, right? What? Why is this allowed to be up? Deplatform this crap. Uh, just so you know, that's the that, school of greatness. <laughs> this, this is the school of greatness. How you get you? Well, how are we going to deal with our debt? We're going to clone dogs. We could sell them. 
Uh, <laughs> so you know, <laughs> the the that that of our debt, something like less than thirty percent of our debt is owned by foreign investors. Never mind China. Yeah, Man, China's like probably owns like 10, 12 percent of our debt, and that's you know not insignificant. But we're going to have to go to war with China because they own 10% of our debt. Do you know who we owe the most amount of money to? We owe the most amount of money to ourselves. To Social Security, to the uh, Federal Reserve. Hey, just It is literally an accounting. It is a stroke of a pen, and it is gone. Um. Well, Maybe the we, was, he's got, we got to fight Kelsen. China because we owe them too much money. This is just absurd, like stupidity. Just unbelievable. Is this why we're fighting ourselves now? <laughs> well, maybe that's why there's so much polarization because we're mad that we owe, we owe ourselves this money. And so we're at war with each uh, ourselves. Mm -hmm. If only we could clone ourselves. If only we had cloned dogs and then everybody would be happy. I love in the middle of that, he's like, gosh, I know, this is some heavy stuff to think about. <laughs> if, if, they, if we find some new unobtainium where we start cloning people, like, you know, we can clone dogs. I mean, these are just some heady issues that we got to front. This is so deep. So, so, like, okay, it's one thing to go into, like, the Elon Musk, you know, crypto world space that they're all in, that all the, the people who, like, the crypto Nazis. This is, like, a completely different, they're trying to, to pull an Oprah. When they're going on Lewis Howe, who I don't think has a political perspective at all, when he's having right. Dave Rubin on, this is dangerous territory. They're, they're... Well, this is Dave Rubin having Lewis Howe on, right? Isn't no, it? No, this was Lewis Howe's School of Greatness, isn't that? Yeah. Oh, he was having Dave Rubin, Dave Rubin on? on. Naturally. Like Oprah having Dave Rubin on. Like his audience, and it's not Oprah audience, but it's a very, very large audience. Wow. Yeah, that's dangerous. They should have a producer who knows what they're talking about. Like, oh, oh my God, we're going to get to war with China because of um, we owe uh, ten percent of our debt to them, twelve percent of our debt. Maybe they have Tucker Carlson's old producer helping them out. It's it's stunning, but it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, it's oh God. All right, Perfect. let's just get rid of it since we're on uh, since we're dining on stupidity. Uh, Tim <laughs> Pool, uh, this is from this is from uh, Tim Pool clips that um, somebody as helpfully is pulling on uh, Twitter. That way we don't have to, uh, uh, you don't have to watch Tim Pool because we're presenting you clips that Tim, that we don't have to watch because Tim Pool clips on Twitter does. You should follow uh, Tim Pool clips on Twitter. But here is uh, Tim Pool um, saying that the Republicans are full of sexy people. Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> you go to the RNC and what do you typically see? The dudes are all tall, chiseled, rugged, you know. The women are all slim and busty and attractive. You go to the DNC and what do you see? The guys are all short, frumpy, overweight, and unattractive. And the women are overweight as well. What? And I was, I, was, I was reading something about why that is. And the general <laughs> idea that I've come up with, because I was reading something about the trend being true. Generally, at, you know, the Republicans have a, have a skew slightly towards more attractive and I, uh, whether or not it's true because of one study is, is you know, not the point. I'll, I will say, you right, know, right, anecdotally, right. I've, I've witnessed this. And so my conclusion is it's really simple, actually. If you're a very, you know, tall, deep-voiced, attractive man, you're going to get through life easier than a short, weak, you know, out-of-shape man. Mm. And you are going to then think, if I could do it on my own, everyone else can too. Or at least you'll be like, I want to be left alone and succeed on my own because I've done better on my own. You take these other people who are unattractive and out of shape and they struggle. So they band together and form collectives mm -hmm. and then vote for collectivism because life isn't easy, you know. In a weird way, he basically just made a point about you're born into the situation you're born in and have privilege. Right. Well, half the people at the RNC are former reality show <laughs> contestants. <laughs> It's like the Bachelorette contestants. You're right. This is just like, I mean, it, it, the odd thing is, is that, yes, there is probably, it is probably the case that people who are wealthier and um, uh, have an easier life feel like, oh, I must, I, I this must be not just a uh, luck of the draw, but in fact is uh, the way that everybody experiences things. And that um, 
I, I don't know that I buy the whole um, argument about, you know, they look better. Although, you know, uh, wealthy people have access uh, to, you know, uh, purchasing better clothes. I can go to a high-priced hair salon. I can uh, have a stylist yeah. and um, and facelifts. And, uh, That's not Republicans, though. That's, like, the Republican leadership. That's Republican donors. Republicans? He's literally saying Republicans are just better looking people. I actually think there's a real he's strategy talking about here. the He's talking about the conventions and the conventions, I would imagine, you know, uh, the uh, the party apparatus, uh, probably wealthy, far wealthier at the. There's no doubt. The top one percent in both those places, I think, are probably at parity in terms of the money. Yeah. But I bet you there is a far greater range of of. Of income uh levels at a democratic national convention than at the republican national convention i'm just There's gonna just no one name one name out there john katzmatibis <laughs> google him if you want to see that? like you don't know who he, he ran for he owns gristides he ran for mayor last time and he's running again as a republican okay. just you know is he hot oh he's beautiful Fair. oh but i'm not talking about attractiveness just broadly speaking i'm just talking about wealth no, but he's about, wealthy. No, but I'm saying, saying I'm saying broadly speaking, I think at the at DNC you're going to have a greater disparity of wealth than you will at the RNC. Of course. Now I don't know if there's a direct correlation, but it, listen to him. He's like they're they're chiseled and, I mean, it's simple. No, they're, they're they're talking about Nazis. They their archetype is the Nazi like proud boy chiseled white man yeah i think there is some a little bit of that like the actually the master race made an appearance at the rnc <laughs> you could see him around there i you know, like a tim pool just like sort of like i'm just gonna get high and i'm just going to uh you know and and, and maybe i'm only speaking metaphorically i don't know if tim pool smokes pot and i'm just gonna come up with a half-baked theory and it's high on marvel movies i'm gonna make uh, i'm just gonna make a hundred thousand dollars off of a video that i that i spew it out there and that's it that's basically his business model fantastic it'd be I mean, nice it would be nice sign me up for that um so there's been obviously a lot of protests in um in oregon and um you know look we saw the footage of um of the cops giving out water to the guy who went on and shot killed two people the kid uh, 17 year old, I don't know if you want to call him a kid, 17 year old, uh, you know, armed to the hilt, uh, th shot three people, killed two. And there is increasing evidence that we have, and, and people know this, but it's still sort of shocking to see the video of it. Here is, um, what, what are we going to do? Like, this is from Mike Baker. Um, should we compare these two uh, things of, uh, of, do we have footage from like the way, well, people can see that they gas and they beat um, BLM protesters. Here's how they treat right-wing protesters, like in the same context, right? I just already hit me once today, homeboy. I'm not going to be stupid. Go up. Go away. Hey, go on your hey. side. Come on. I'm going to be stupid. Listen, listen, listen. Listen for one second. Let's agree. Listen. Let's agree. Let's agree. Let's agree. Let's agree. Let's agree. Let's agree that we're not going to agree and stop. I'm asking them to go. Everybody, go back to your side over there now. Enough. Enough. Go all the way back over there. That was likely stolen by one of these. You're right, but there's no point to it. Go back. So you have right wingers uh, who are crashing the protests, the peaceful protests of those on the left, and the way that the police handle it is, please, guys, please go away. Well, they were wearing blue. Did you see that they were wearing the Blue Lives Matter, the blue, blue line shirt too? Mm. So. They're actually there supporting the cops. Clearly, there's, you know, who knows who was there. Well, and, you know, we saw the videos with Rittenhouse um, in Milwaukee or in uh, Kenosha. And it, but the thing that's more troubling is the way these cops are clearly using their awareness of where the line of militia type uh, people are 
um, as like an asset for how to corral these protests. Yeah. Like, and I mean, that's, I think it's really disgusting and it's terrifying to me how mayors and governors seem to have no kind of control over that. Nothing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy. It really is crazy. Um, it's a real problem. And um, it worries me in terms of like, you know, the potential for violence that we have, you know, coming up, like where, where are the cops going to fall on this? Right. Um, when, 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 when you have the potential for, you know, proud boys crashing into, uh, you know, some, um, uh, a, a place County where they're counting votes in Wisconsin, let's say, mm-hmm. or Michigan. Well, to Matt's point, like if we do go through this transition, if, if Trump's not a lot, if, if he loses, and that transition period, I mean, it really is going to be the mayors and the governors, the Democratic governors who are literally doing nothing right now to chime in. If you have police chiefs that are, who knows? Who knows what's yeah. going to happen with them? But like, they got to step up. They got to do something because it's, it's seeing that happen in New York or I don't know. I mean, in Wisconsin, like there's no model that exists right now. And I mean... I think, Matt, Matt, this is the whole point. Like, what are the Democrats going to do? What, and that's why Trump is able to to say it's cities that are violent. It's cities. It's Democratic. You're right. It is Democratic mayors that are not taking control of the situation. You're absolutely right, Trump. You're, you're absolutely right. They're not cracking down on the police. Why? Right. After all this, why? Dude, why are they the still SBA, silent? Like, tweeted out this week about Richie Torres. Did you see that? Oh, Tweet? yeah. That was just It was unreal. really weird. And Richie it's Torres a whore. Is, yeah, it's yeah. it is it seems to me like, you know, I don't think there should be some type of like you know, this is not the military, right? But I I don't think that a police union should be going out and targeting uh any politicians in that particularly in that way. Like I mean, but it, that that's that's scary. And Congressman Torres is not some progressive. He's it was very odd that whole I mean, granted, he marched, but so have many elected officials, citywide elected officials have marched to choose Torres out of everybody. It was a very Very odd, weird weird situation. Call him from a 508 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, is this me? Yes, it is. Who's this? Hi, this is Adva. I'm calling from Brooklyn, but originally from Westboro. So shout out to the central mass area i love it i went to uh, um, i went to an elementary school in westboro that is no longer there it was where it was the the old digital campus it was like a one of those like progressive forward-thinking schools that gave a lot of uh i guess a lot of scholarships and went out of business like 50 years very ago. cool oh i'm sorry it's not there anymore um i did actually want to ask for a shofar it was my birthday this weekend um, and on one last thing after that. Okay, you go, you go, and I'll look for the shofar. Okay, well, I also just opened up a lovely present for my roommate, and it is a Majority Report sweatshirt with the left is best on the back. Oh you my guys, gosh. it's lovely. This is too much. And, you know, thanks to the roommate, obviously. <laughs> um, other than that, sending love. Good luck and all that good stuff. Um, lovely to just have you guys around. Well, appreciate the phone call. Enjoy the sweatshirt. And uh, thanks so much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. right. Um, just looking at um, Yakima Abogado on, uh, that is uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, Twitter feed. The sky at 8.30 in the morning is... Uh, a, a beautiful color of crimson, red, orange from the fires there. Um, terrifying. People, stay safe, please. Really, uh, just I. Uh, and the power's out now in these schools. It's horrifying. Unbelievable. Oh my god. Let's uh, go to the phones. Call from a seven zero seven area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Seven oh seven, going once. Seven oh seven, going twice. 
707 going three times. Gone. Try uh, one more. We don't have too much time left, and we'll do some IMs. Calling from a 630 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, Sam. Is this, uh, is this me? It is you, I think. <laughs> Who is this, and where are you calling excellent, from? Excellent. Excellent. I've always wanted to say that. My name is Brian. I'm from Chicagoland. Brian from Chicago. About, yes, sir. I'm about 20 miles outside of the city. Um, I just firstly wanted to say I will be brief. Um, I wanted to thank you and the crew for everything you do. It's really given me a lot of hope in these dark times. Um, You're welcome. You guys keep on doing what you do. Thank you. Now, my question is rather pertinent. Um, I'm seeing a lot of this unrest and protest uh, going on in our city, too, here. And as someone who lives with others who are immunocompromised, it is, you know, really daunting upon me that our right to protest is being infringed upon. And in my opinion, it's kind of dangerous the way that certain cities, municipalities are implementing curfew laws to kind of curb some of those, those protests and give them a ability to arrest people more easily. In your opinion, what kind of unified message can we send to democratic leadership to make sure that going forward, especially post-election, our right to protest safely is ensured. What does that That's have to do right. with, um, uh, I, and I appreciate the phone call, but what, what, is that, uh, what does that have to do with being immunocompromised? I'm not sure. You, you're saying that when, if, if you get arrested and, and you, you're, 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 you're I don't, I don't know, I'm not sure I follow. Okay, if I may. So largely um, that has to do with corralling techniques I've noticed uh, occurring in Portland and other areas. The cattle, in which police that's correct. Okay. Um, so, in terms of protecting yourself as a protester, um, who largely wear masks, um, right? I just wanted to see what your thoughts were upon our ability to maintain that right, especially if things become a little bit more heated post election. Okay, all right, and I some are detained that. too, they're being detained into these uh, places. I was reading an article about someone who was detained and put in a warehouse that had chemical leaks in the warehouse. Yeah, I mean, it. look, this is a this is a problem even uh, without COVID, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, and the the kettling, as far as I know, was developed during the IRNC in two thousand four. Where, just to make people clear on what happens, is uh, the cops basically surround the protesters and use in, uh, different devices to do this. Sometimes they use their bikes now. I've noticed, but or they would use these orange nettings yeah. as a way of basically just corralling them and corralling them very, very close quarters. Right. Um, and, and then maybe arresting them and putting them into like holding, uh, uh, areas. Um, the, the, there, there has to be, I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't know how you go about doing that except for on the local level. I mean, if there were pressure coming from a, uh, federal leadership, I suppose you could have a DOJ that was like set out a memo to cities. This is the only way I can imagine it could happen saying like, look, you got to protect uh, people's right to free speech. And in the context of a pandemic, that means you cannot put them in harm's way for exercising it. Right. And unless there's like extreme circumstances that there is a compelling, um, reason you know the the safety of uh the city for you know I, I don't know what what context that would be that's the only way i can imagine that there would be any type of um you know sort of like coherent response i don't know uh, any other mechanism uh, except for on a you know state by state municipality by municipality level could somebody sue the police department for kettling them, detaining them. And, and like, to be clear, like in a lot of these, I don't know if you've been kettled before, but sometimes you're just on the sidewalk. And I remember oh, yeah. I was at a climate protest and a guy was literally pulled. He's like, yo, 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 I'm not part of this. And they kettled him. It was oh, crazy. Yeah. He was walking home on fifth Avenue. He supported us, but yep. It's yep. absolutely. Uh, Bullprog just put out a video on protesting and protecting ourselves in terms of like uh, of of you know protecting yourself in the context of 
of COVID. Uh, let me read some uh, IMs. Folks, I don't think we're going to have time. Well, maybe we have time for one more phone call here. I'll grab one. A lot of folks been hanging on for a long time. Call from a 458 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is uh, Zarak. I live in Missouri. Zarak in Missouri. You are the final caller of the day. Yeah, you guys brought it up, and so I'm not really – this is maybe – pointless but i'm Ew. i have friends in missouri here obviously very trump supportive and you know i don't get anywhere with them but i i like to get in heated conversations and piss them off and you know they call me the marxist and all that but uh i'm just like why it, to me it just seems it's just it's inevitable trump doesn't leave office if he loses and the fascist tendencies and the military and the police, um, you know, come to full force and back him. And there's just an all out, you know, fascist takeover. And what, what mechanism do you see, um, uh, being, or that's in place already that can, you know, uh, avert that. All right. Uh, we'll take your call offline. Appreciate the call, man. Um, Thank you. I have uh, a lot of respect for uh, people who like to get into arguments uh, for you know, seeming no reason. Um, I, I, I personally don't think that the, I don't think that like if there is an, an official resolution to the election that Donald Trump is going to somehow like, you know, surround the white house with um federal um you know uh prison guards or something like that and uh you know and i think if he does people are just gonna like um okay uh so you're in the white house you're not the president yeah. um i do think that what's going to happen to the extent that there's going to be any type of violence i think it's going to be you know sort of like what i've outlined uh, you know on and sort of like more localized and as a way of inhibiting the counting of votes in a certain way so that a certain amount of time passes and if these cases go to the michigan supreme court or the wisconsin supreme court or the florida state supreme court a uh, state supreme courts those are all conservative courts and um the way i think this would happen is that they would rule in favor of trump whatever that is right like oh well, you can't count the mail-in ballots because there there's too many instances of, of flaws we can't do a do over the election uh and just, we're just gonna the only fair way to do this is to not count any of the 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 absentee ballots or something something along those lines I mean, this is all pure speculation obviously on my part and I think if you try and go to the state, the, to the federal Supreme Court, I think they'll reject the case. I mean, I think that's the worst case. That's sort of the the scariest scenario. Um, I don't know what the mechanism to get Donald Trump out of the White House is per se. I, I'm not as worried about that because there's no way they would. I mean, the Republicans, Pence, he they would as soon as they know they lost, they're out. They're not. They're not going to back him up if he's he's playing ego. Correct. The process of them it. knowing that he's lost, though, that is exactly. that's where the danger is. It's exactly. that, that, that period from the time that the voting ends on November 3rd to whenever a winner is declared by the various states. Right. I mean, right. and there's going to be these court cases between secretaries of states and and uh, and, um, you know, uh, it, it's it's I think it's going to be. A they just need to make sure the Republicans that the states where it's the closest are the states, as you just said, that have Republican-led courts, legislatures, yep. et cetera. And I don't know. I mean, if it's it could come down to Pennsylvania for all we know, and then it's not the case. Right. Pennsylvania's got a, um, a left-leaning uh, state Supreme Court. Exactly. Uh Zach from Florida. Can I, can I just say, I just want to say, um, I think that the police in this country are fascist. And I think there's, you know, a lot of right wing tendencies in the military, but I don't think they're that wing that they're willing to like go for broke just because Biden was picked over Trump. Right. Yeah. And I, and I don't, you know, like, I don't even know if they would have done that if it was Bernie, although I don't know, but, um, but there has to be a sense that they can win and and that that would involve a certain amount of delusion i think um 
you know, right now they're 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 able to get away when they're attacking activists. They're able mm-hmm. to get away with a lot of this stuff. Um, it's a different it's a different calculus when they are protecting uh, a president that look the majority of the American people who will be voting will vote against Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. There's just no doubt about that. I mean, it'd be mm-hmm. highly, whether that is distributed in such a way that, that, that makes Joe Biden the winner of the presidential election, that's a different question. Right. But I can tell you the majority of Americans and they don't want to see the, the police deciding that they're going to take over the election. I just don't think it's going to fly. And the police don't have that. They're going to, I mean, if, if there's any opportunity for Democrats to come in and start pushing back against police in these cities, that's it. Oh, yep. Your budget, boom, guess what? Just cut exactly. your budget. Exactly. Wait. From a political standpoint, yes, that might not be a bad thing for those of us who want to see um, redistribution of, of, of the of city and state budgets, frankly. Mm-hmm. Uh, Zach from Florida, I've decided to vote for Biden. His campaign isn't reaching out to young progressives, so it's incumbent upon us to do it. I mean, look, the the... Uh, without a doubt, um, I, the campaign, I think, is just does not seem to be interested or, you know, and, and, and they may be taking these votes for granted. But, you know, I don't I, I'm going to use Joe Biden for my agenda. <laughs> that, that's the way that I approach this. I don't I'm not, I'm not waiting Joe for Joe Biden to tell me what is in my best interest. I know what's in my best interest. My best interests are not to have Donald Trump in office. And and I, you know, I'm not going to go through the whole definition of what my best interests are for today, but broadly speaking in terms of my politics, um it is to have Donald Trump out of office. And Joe Biden is the sadly, but it is the case, the best vehicle to do that. Really, the only vehicle to do that. Um and well- and to your earlier point about it, it really, the burden, we, this is not a normal election. So the, the Biden campaign needs to use 2016, as David Axrod said a couple of days after the election, when everybody was blaming the Russians and the millennials and, and Bernie people for Hillary's loss, he said one line, it should have never been so close. So this time around, if we don't want it to go to the courts, if we don't want to have extreme unrest continuing and growing, then we need to make sure as many different groups, not just Republicans that are voting Democratic, not that kind of big tent. We need to mobilize a massive coalition so that it doesn't come close in Wisconsin. It doesn't come close in yep. in, in in Missouri, for God's sakes. I mean. Yep. Tim Pulitzer, uh, can you guys reach out to Ayn Rand Institute Libertarian Yaron Brook for a debate? He was brought up previously as somebody to bring on, but he said he was uh, he was waiting to hear from you guys. Huh. He's is he who is he? Is he waiting to hear from us? We've been in contact with him. Uh, it's have? just a matter of timing. Yeah. Oh, okay. You well, want to yeah, debate let's... this guy? I mean, <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, Disco okay. Stew. Glenn Greenwald ran interference for Trump on the veteran story, and Trump RT'd him this weekend as if Trump hasn't made our military industrial complex problem worse. Can we stop pretending yet? Come on. I, 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 don't, I don't know what that's about. I mean, I think, you know, uh, Glenn is, you know, like just, I don't know, looking at like some very fine points and um, is looking for, I think, in, in some instances, just sort of like the biggest pedestal on which to make those. I mean, and there may be, uh, I you know, I don't trust uh, Jeffrey Goldberg. I don't trust anybody involved in that story. I don't trust Goldberg. I don't trust Trump. I don't trust, um, Sa- you know, John Bolton. I don't trust uh, Sarah Sanders. I don't, uh, I think John Kelly is a piece of garbage. Um, and there's no, um, I mean, all of it. I don't, I don't trust any of them. And this is a, uh, you know, they, a political campaign and you know the idea that the story has feeds into a narrative about Donald Trump that so it's easy for people to believe we don't know we're never going to know what the truth of this story is there is no truth to this story one way or another um 
you know, so we're not going to know. And and to sort of like say, like, I can't believe people are overstating the story or not overstating the story. I don't know. It just seems to be like completely arbitrary. And now Michael Cohen's book that he published while he was in jail, it's, it's another version of this. F- folks who have grievances for very real reasons, not the best people to, to whatever. It's, 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 it's politics. This is just like pure politics. It's not a court of law. It's politics. Right. right. Exactly. Um, and from a journalistic standpoint, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, should you have anonymous source? Like on something like this, it's just sort of like, it, it, it's gossipy. The whole thing I, is gossipy. I me. think the problem is, is it sets the standard now. It might be true. It might be a uh, great if it's, it's used to be a weapon against Trump, whatever we get it. I think the problem is, is that this is now the standard and it's used on the left as well. Yeah, but this is not like a new standard. I mean, you know. No, you're right. Like, you know, this, there's, you can find oh, a million of these, <laughs> a million of these. <clears throat> uh, Jersey expat. Yesterday in Dobbs Ferry, New York, someone would left a t-shirt on local doorsteps with welcome to Dobbs Ferry on the back and a dog whistle messaging on the back, accusing people of trying to change the town and telling them to leave Dobbs Ferry the way they found it. So far, it appears all the recipients were minority households. To show solidarity with the recipients, disavow this kind of behavior. There'll be a Black Lives Matter rally in town this Saturday, 9-12 at 12 p.m. sharp. The corner of Cedar Street, spelled C-E-D-A-R Street and Main. If anyone listening wants to join us, we'd love to have your support. All right, let's do uh, f- five more of these and then out of it. Simple Socialist. Hey, Sam, watching your old anarcho-capitalist videos, I noticed you think ANCAPs are advocating a Mad Max scenario. Uh, my aunt, oh, oh, okay. Have you considered the fact that Mad Max is rad? They have sweet cars and cool leather outfits and a plethora of job opportunities from slave metal guitarist accompanying <laughs> war drummers, cancer ridden Fort Soldier, BDMS Raider. That uh, seems pretty cool to me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Rick Ama Huron, the mayor of Squim, Washington, is a bold QAnon a nutcase, first Q mayor in the country. This is like, this, they talk about a virus. Uh, Lefty Lib, is Sam brave enough to answer the 607 area code today? Will the phones work? Much love. Shoot. <laughs> saw that too. Wait a second. Should we just take this quickly? I'll do it quick. This guy hung on. Call from a 607 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Wait, I'm not even connected. Uh-oh. Hold on. This is dumb. Why am I doing this? Okay, 607. Quick. What's on your mind? Hello? Hello, what's on your mind? Quick. Uh, I'm the libertarian trying to get a hold of you for a while. Okay, Just wanted libertarian. to point out that not all, not all libertarians are right-wing fascists, and I think that you're associating them you're giving Trump too much credit calling him a libertarian. I've never <laughs> called um, uh, Trump a libertarian. So there, well, I just ben beat Shapiro, you on that point. Ben Shapiro, Ben Shapiro, and they're not libertarians. Oh, okay. I know. I, I forgot. Okay. So what? tell me what a libertarian is, because you are, you join the uh, 100 percentile of libertarians who've called in to say that everyone else we've ever talked to who claims to be a libertarian or anybody else who claims to be a libertarian is actually not a libertarian. You are a true libertarian. What does that mean? Well, I think the, uh, the ideology requires that you leave the fiscal conservatism that the Lincoln project and uh, modern Republicans are just hanging on to. It's been disproven in Kansas. It's been disproven everywhere so if you have an ideology and the facts change you just have to change your position and i think you you there's a there's a patriotism that all the libertarians involve and you're just giving the right the the property of it I wait, think wait, wait, wait. stop, best, stop but... telling me i uh, stop telling me what i'm doing about uh, that I've, I've i've redefined libertarianism tell me what libertarianism no, you is. what is what is libertarianism to you it's uh, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. It's ending ICE. It's ending, uh, you know, Department of Homeland Security. It's giving people Medicare for all. It's literally life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Medicare for all? What? 
Medicare for all is your libertarian position. Government program? Yeah, I think uh, I don't think people would be more destitute and sick with it. What other libertarian can you point to agrees with your position on this? Uh, I I can point out plenty of people on Reddit who are pissed that the libertarian subreddit is being brigaded by Bernie Bros. And I think that there's a big movement of libertarians that, you know, want the gays to have their own marijuana plantations and just get left the fuck along. (laughs) And I think you're... Thanks for the call. What? (laughs) No. At the end of the show, man, I thought you were really bringing something serious, but there's something that's not, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. All right, three oh, more yeah. IMs. That was disappointing. I thought we were going to be a real libertarian there. I think the Twitter was the, the Twitter lobbying. That's the kicker. That's really, they're showing their cards there. Three, uh, train boy, given you you recently had Judy Gold on the show recently, would you consider hosting Nick Mullen some Friday to give his side of their beef? Who's Nick Mullen? Of, uh, We've okay. talked about this, Sam. Oh, is there. he the guy from Saturday Night Live? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I guess. I don't yeah, even he's know. He's from what, Saturday Night Live? He, didn't no. she recant or something? He's an actor, right? Like, I, uh, unlikely. Let's put it that way. But maybe. Yeah. Uh, Morella 622 today's interview was very interesting. Sam makes a good companion piece to the Pearlstein book you highlighted recently. Thank you. And the final I am of the day... I, I don't know. I, 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 uh, sorry, I hate, I hate to end on this uh, note, but uh, did a 50-mile bike ride yesterday, says Chicago bureaucrat. And I got to say, Sunday Lake, uh, Sunset Lake CBD Sav has got my chafed up boys feeling good. Cool. cool. <laughs> All right, folks, see you. Tomorrow. Nomi, thank you. Check out Nomi Show at 3 p.m. Go there now. 20 minutes from now. The Nomi Key Show at YouTube. It might take all the strength I got To get to where I want But I know somehow